do we migrate? That's the tone for leaving a legacy that enhances how media work is done and how you and I remain informed. My name is Inshira Addo. I'm the head of uh, strategic uh, projects and business development as well as thought leadership at the Multimedia Group, and I will be your master of ceremonies uh, this morning. I'd like to start off with uh, a welcome address by the president of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, and uh, that's the pursing of Andrew Danso Eninkra. Let's welcome him with a round of applause, please. Thank you, Inshira. Colleague broadcasters, representation from the diplomatic hall and civil society organizations, broadcast media industry and allied services personnel, distinguished guest, fellow media journalist and all other protocols duly observed. It is a humbling duty for me to welcome all of you to this Broadcast Industry Forum today, Thursday, 6th June, 2019, at the Swiss Spirits and Suites Alisa Hotel, Accra. The theme for this forum is digital migration and the future of free-to-air television in Ghana. The Republic of Ghana signed on to the Geneva 2006, that is the GE06 agreement, establishing the Digital Terrestrial Broadcasting Frequency Plan in the radio frequency band 174 to 230 megahertz and 470 to 862 megahertz. The agreement set 17th June 2015 as the deadline for the transition from analog to digital broadcasting in the ultra high frequency UHF bands four and five. This deadline and many subsequent time commitments have been missed by Ghana for various reasons. Now critical among these reasons is the lack of an agreed clear roadmap and policy document guiding the process in Ghana. Over the years, discussions and agreements that are needed to consolidate the migration process and cement the resolve of key industry players to have a universally accepted platform has been frustrated by ambitions covertly overladen with inexplicable intentions. A draft policy document which has finally been raised only after several agitations and similar forum in the past seem to be infested with undesirable septic shocks that will send the broadcasting industry into terminal coma should implementation be allowed without questions. Per the current draft policy for digital terrestrial television, the Ministry of Communication, MOC, seeks to encrypt all hitherto free-to-air television channels and grant conditional access to viewers subject to the payment of digital access fees. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association and other key broadcast stakeholders have expressed discomfort about the draft policy on many grounds. Among others, that the MOC move to encrypt free-to-air television as an affront to media independence and freedom and a denial of the individual's right to information. Notwithstanding, the MOC has taken steps towards implementation of the said policy, even though it remains a draft. The recent publication by the National Communication Authority prohibiting the distribution of previously approved DTT receivers is an example of such steps taken to realize the draft policy, which has not been validated by the, by the major stakeholders impacted by it. Another related issue is the position by the MOC that the governing board of the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited, CDTL, the company, now we don't know whether the company had been formed or is to be formed, but the company formed 
to manage the monopoly infrastructure for digital terrestrial television transmission in Ghana is to be appointed by the president without recourse to the National Media Commission as prescribed by the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Key among the questions that have come up in this debate include whether the policy of a monopoly signal distributor is the way to go, the impact of free-to-air encryption on the business of free-to-air broadcasters who rely solely on advertising revenue, whether there are alternatives for funding the national DTT infrastructure and developing allied businesses that supports the digital experience other than encrypting program content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This forum will be, able, will be ably chaired by the president of the Ghana Journalist Association, will take the form of a discussion by a panel of experts made up of an expert from the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, a senior legal practitioner with expertise in media and telecoms, an executive council member of GIBA, who is world vexed in broadcasting engineering, the executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, and the executive, some executive members of other associations that are related to the media industry. It is our expectation that this forum will shed light on the thorny issues raised and provide much needed answers on the vast on the best way forward to preserve the crucial role of the media in a digital era while safeguarding the democratic culture in Ghana. We also believe that your participation, as well as the live broadcast on some TV channels, live streaming, blogging, and subsequent discussions will contribute significantly in achieving that end. We are hopeful that the time and resource spent here today will go down the history books of broadcasting in Africa as the turning point in giving voice to the industry in choosing for itself what is best and most preferred over what political authority prescribe and enforce. Welcome all and enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Danso and Inkra. Uh, I wouldn't waste any more time. This is a man who uh, doesn't need too much introduction. Is the president of the Ghana Journalist Association, Mr. Roland Afilmoni. Let's welcome him, please. Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished promoters and entrepreneurs of Ghanaian media organizations, panel of experts, fellow journalists and members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I deem it a great privilege to chair this forum, which gives all of us the opportunity to dispassionately discuss what is thought to be another threat to media freedom and independence and by reference, by inference, the practice of journalism in Ghana. Ghana, like the rest of the world, is transitioning from analog to digital broadcasting. The ability to practice free and fair journalism forms the backbone of information delivery through public service broadcasting to the citizenry while holding government accountable to the people. This helps the entire Ghanaian population to contribute their quota to nation building. It is our belief that digital migration with its endless possibilities will help in the socioeconomic development of our nation, Ghana. As we are transitioning from analog to dig digital broadcasting, practitioners and well-meaning citizens of Ghana are, are, are apprehensive about the Ministry of Communications policy to encrypt free-to-air television. GIBA and other stakeholders have also expressed disquiet about the draft policy on the grounds, among other things, that the ministry's move to encrypt free-to-air television 
is an affront to media independence and freedom and a denial of the individual's right to information. We may be mistaken in our fears, we may be right about them, but one thing we are sure about is that we have a right to be paranoid. Our constitution guarantees the freedom and independence of the media, the individual's right to information, and the responsibility of the media to hold government accountable to the people of Ghana. Since the advent of the Fourth Republic, these rights and responsibilities have been tested in diverse ways, including decisions by law courts, and today our law reports are replete with judicial pronouncements upholding the freedom and independence of the media. As media practitioners, we cannot separate the tools we use in carrying out our duties from the content we produce and deliver. We just celebrated World Press Freedom Day last month, and as a nation, we pledged to ensure that the freedom of the media to operate is ensured as it is enshrined in our 1992 constitution. The purpose of this forum is to ensure that our resolve is actualized even in this process of digital migration. I urge all participants of this forum, our government and the listening public to participate and listen with an open mind and at the same time with keen interests as the matters to be discussed here are fundamental to the growth of our ever maturing democratic culture. Thank you and God bless us all. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Afil Morni. And um, we're going to dive straight into a couple of presentations, uh, after which uh, we'll have a panel discussion uh, so we can all join in. And uh, if you're tuned into um, multi TV or city TV, um, I'd like to let you know we're live from the Alisa. Uh, Swiss Spirit Alisa Hotel here in Accra, and this is the Broadcast Media Industry Forum brought to you by the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association. Uh, we're live across the country on more than 200 radio and television channels. Uh, we also have affiliates around the world, and on the continent, um, we're broadcasting via channel 421, um, and uh, also on the Go TV uh, channel 178. Uh, we're also on the web. Uh, if you go to citynewsroom.com or myjoyonline.com, you'll be able to find the feed there. And also the GIBA, uh, Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, um, Facebook link also is sharing a live stream of this very important uh, forum. I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker. Uh, he's uh, an executive council member uh, and also uh, a committee member. Uh, very, very well versed in the um, technical aspects of digital broadcasting. Uh, executive council of Gibba, representing the free tour uh, and uh, also the chairman for the legal and regulatory uh, ethics committee. Uh, his uh, day job is uh, as director uh, of operations for Crystal TV uh, and also a commissioner member of the National Media Commission in the person of Prince Harry Crystal. Uh, he will be presenting next. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. The Chairman, President of Ghana Journalists Association, Mr. Roland Afel Moni, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, the Honorable Chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Communications and its members, Chairman and members of the Giba Council of Elders, the President of Giba, Mr. Dansu Eninkra, representatives from the Ministry of Communications, from the Ministry of Information, from the National Media Commission, National Communications Authority, civil society organizations present, 
traditional rulers, Nananum, fellow members of the Executive Council of GIBA, stakeholders and allied media service providers, GIBA member stations, members of the media fraternity, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll set the tone for uh, today's forum uh, by letting you know the core of the issues and then would uh, dovetail into letting you know where we came from and where we are. So uh, today, uh, as per the DTT draft policy we have before us, uh, the Ministry of Communication is requesting that all set of boxes and for the benefit of viewers, all decoders must have a conditional access system or what we call an access control mechanism. And this means that all digital TV channels we are all currently watching will be scrambled and every TV screen will be blank with no programs to watch, unless Ghanaians buy a new type of decoder, which will be prescribed by the Ministry of Communications, and thereafter, viewers will be charged a monthly fee to enable them access even free-to-air broadcast services. This is the issue. So I'll take you back to um, where we began um, as a broadcast industry in terms of uh, migrating analog uh, broadcasting to digital broadcasting. So Ghana commenced its digital migration process as early as 2007, whereby the National Communications Authority set up an industry technical committee comprising the state broadcaster, that's the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, the private TV stations represented by the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, that's GIBA, government representatives and other stakeholders, namely the Ghana Standards Authority, National Media Commission, Consumer Protection Associations, Ghana Institute of Engineers, among others, to make recommendations for a complete switchover of all broadcast channels from analog to digital. The extensive stakeholder consultations carried out by the committee resulted in the presentation of the August 2010 report, which is referred to as the Digital Migration Roadmap, to the government on the migration from analog to digital broadcasting in Ghana, which was later approved by the government of Ghana. One major recommendation from the roadmap was the need for both public and private entities, and in this case, GBC and GIBA, to form a public-private partnership in order to successfully deliver the DTT migration from the nation, DTT migration program for the nation. GIBA had its first disappointment when this PPP arrangement All right, uh, that comes with technicalities, and it happens in... Probably there's a conditional access on the microphone. <laughs> so, um, digital migration roadmap also... Terrestrial television receiver standard. Terrestrial television is what we have read as BTT. BTT is a poison. But uh, we're talking about DTT, and simply put to Ghanaians, DTT is total TV. So uh, 
the roadmap set up a digital television, short television standard by the Ghana Standards Authority to ensure that all DTT free to air set up boxes or decoders and integrated digital TVs, which we call IDTVs, or in your homes you call it digital TVs, conform to the minimum specifications and to protect from the dumping of substances. Subsequently, the Ghana Standards Authority is free to add digital. Millions of over 500 millions of over 500 DTT free to air receivers, and that is the digital TVs and the decoders, in full compliance with the conformance regime and the GS 1099 standard published by the Ghana Standards Authority. And as a result, many Ghanaians or millions of Ghanaians are receiving free to air digital TV channels in their homes, offices, and public. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> so, the need to formulate policy to guide the broadcasting sector in the era of digital broadcasting became necessary, and in the year 2016, the first draft policy of the DTT was issued for stakeholders to make their inputs. In putting together the first draft policy document, the DBMC and the NCA, working with the Ministry of Communication, considered various existing laws, including the Electronic Communications Act, and other several laws, as well as the 1992 Constitution that grants, in particular, freedoms and guarantees the establishment and operations of mass media communication in Ghana. So among other objectives that were set, was to ensure that the draft policy as put together is to guarantee the availability of all existing terrestrial analog television stations in digital formats in at least their current existing coverage areas. Number two, to make available all existing television households access to digital television services and ensure universal access to existing free-to-air television services. But, and this is where the issue is, but in a sharp U-turn, the Ministry of Communications revised the earlier draft policy and introduced new clauses into the current draft policy as follows. And I'm going to talk about just one or two. The network provider shall implement, the word shall, shall implement a conditional access system to facilitate the collection of digital access fee which will be introduced to replace the existing TV license. This conditional access in addition will support the provision of enhanced broadcast services to citizens. The existing set-top boxes without conditional access, as you have in your homes, will be replaced through a voucher system by the network provider to enable continu continuous viewership of digital television. Two, all licensed free-to-air broadcasters that is satellite free-to-air broadcasters, terrestrial free-to-air broadcasters, and other types of licensed free-to-air broadcaster will be required to encrypt their signals to support the collection of the digital access fee. And this is very interesting. Interesting on two grounds. One, this is a clause that was introduced in December, noted to be the final DTT draft policy stakeholder uh, forum. And number two, it bears the question, how do you want a satellite free-to-air broadcaster to encrypt 
its signal? Are they intending to use the conditional access that the ministry is intending to introduce? Or should they go buy or provide their own conditional access system to run free-to-air satellite service? What happens to satellite channels running free-to-air entering the jurisdiction of Ghana? How do you want to encrypt BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, DWTV, France 24, when their model of service is free-to-air broadcasting? So we do not understand the basis of introducing this clause and saying that free-to-air broadcasters should encrypt their signals. Remember, technically, free-to-air broadcasters on satellite get their frequency parameters not from the NCA. So they do not have any binding relationship with regards to spectrum with the NCA. So how then do you want to enter into this jurisdiction and start enforcing encryption of free-to-air uh, 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 broadcast service? The DTT draft policy also stated, and my president of GIBA already mentioned, that a seven-member governing board shall be appointed by the president. And in this case, we are not saying the president in power, but regardless of who is in government as the president, will oversee the affairs of the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited, which has been incorporated. Membership of the board shall include, and please take note, the chairperson, one representative of the Ministry of Communication, one representative of the Ministry of Finance, one representative of GBC, one representative of GIBA, one representative of the public with infrastructure management expertise, and the chief executive officer shall be appointed by the president in accordance with the laws governing appointments of CEOs of state institution. It is interesting to know that the current draft policy, also from the Ministry of Communication, which has recently been revised, also stated that an estimated 5.8 million households, out of which 4.6 million are TV households. 99% of TV households rely exclusively on free-to-air broadcasting with a little below 1% subscribing to pay TV. One out of the 4.6 million TV households, 1.1 million are poor and vulnerable households who are not in a position to afford digital TV or set-top box. So if this is the statistics drawn from the Ghana Statistical Service and was incorporated by the Ministry of Communications in the DTT draft policy, then why do you want to introduce a conditional access that would charge these 1.1 poor and vulnerable households? All the millions of set-up boxes, and I'm happy to say we have uh, one of the authorized dealers of NCA uh, in the house, they bring in set-up boxes and digital TVs which are fully conformed to the conformance regime. So all these millions of set-up boxes and digital TV sets already approved and certified by the NCA and currently receiving free-to-air signals will abruptly stop receiving the free-to-air program contents. What Giba is saying in this regard is that the Ministry of Communication is overstepping its boundary and now directing free-to-air TV broadcasters to comply with a particular type of broadcast service, which is pay TV, other than what they are currently authorized to offer as classified by the NCA. The free-to-air broadcasters are not just business entities. They, they render media services to promote information flow to the citizenry and the general public by offering the opportunity for all and sundry to partake in the discourse towards nation building through interactive programming, allowing viewers to freely express their opinions, which contributes to deepening our democracy and the socioeconomic development of our nation, Ghana. They also provide a platform to industry or for industry to thrive by publicizing their goods and services for the economic growth of the nation. The free-to-air broadcaster desiring to offer its services to the nation had decided on the type of broadcast authorization that will enable it to achieve this aim. And so they went to the NCA 
and as classified by the NCA to get authorization for free to air, knowing very well that we have another authorization for pay TV. Specifications for all types of TV services in Ghana is the mandate of the regulator NCA, and the NCA backed by the Electronic Communications Act and the National Communication Authority Act have for the purpose of authorizations classified television broadcasting services based on the platform, the business model, and the nature of the broadcasting entity and the service as follows. And I'll read out just two of these types of classifications. Let me also entreat right now that viewers out there, all those listening to us on radio, and those present in this forum should quickly go to the website of the regulator NCA, www.nca.org.gh slash licensing hyphen authorization slash broadcasting hyphen authorization slash television, and you'll find more of these classifications. And I'll talk about these two. Digital terrestrial pay television is one of the classifications. And it says, as described by the NCA, television broadcasting service comprising a bouquet of services provided over an independent or third-party wireless digital terrestrial television network and which requires television viewers to pay a subscription to watch the television service. An example is DSTV. An example is GoTV. An example is First Digital. An example is Mega Choice and Crystal TV having the same authorization. And then the second classification, digital terrestrial free-to-air television program channel, a television broadcasting service in which a single program channel is broadcast and in the clear over a digital terrestrial television network and capable of being received without payment of subscription fees. And this service is what more than 99% of Ghanaians are exclusively relying on, as stated in a ministry's policy document. So what Giba is saying is that free-to-air television must remain free as classified and authorized by the NCA. Let me liken or give you an analogy. If a free-to-air broadcaster is likened to a driving license holder, this will mean that the Ministry of Communication is asking, for example, that a saloon car driver with a particular class of license should now be forced to drive an articulated truck, which is categorized under a different class of license to enable it to use the public road. The services of the pay TV authorization holders is different from that of the free-to-air holder. The fact that more than 99% of households rely on free-to-air broadcasting, as stated by the ministry, is a clear indication that complying to the change in classification of the NCA will also affect the, those households that rely on free-to-air broadcasting. The decision of the ministry, as earlier stated in the draft policy, to charge all viewers a digital access fee to enable them access free-to-air broadcasting will mean that trading the program contents of the free-to-air broadcaster through the introduction of a conditional access technology. So we go and acquire content. You buy the AFCON game for about $10 million or probably $5 million or $1 million. And then the MOC decides they put in a key that would unlock whether a viewer should watch or not watch. And the only reason is because they want to monetize you know, the services and sustain the platform at the detriment of the broadcaster who has gone for these exorbitant rights for the acquisition of contents to serve the same public service in delivering current affair, information, news, and all of that to the public. <coughs> so then, the decision, the conditional access system introduced into the set of boxes has nothing to do with the transmitter signal, but locks or blocks or scramble the content of the content owner. The only relationship the broadcasters have with the NCA and by extension the Ministry of Communication is the need for spectrum of frequency to deliver their broadcast services. Therefore, decisions relating to contents provided by free-to-air broadcasters does not fall within the ambit of the ministry. 
GIBA is strongly opposed to, pro to the proposal to implement a conditional access system, a digital television platform, which has been set up primarily to deliver free-to-air television services to the populace. The ministry must not charge viewers to pay a digital access fee to enable them to watch free-to-air television, when in fact, it is the broadcasters who will be paying for transmission services on the digital TV platform, and which requires more viewers in their numbers for the sustenance of the free-to-air TV business as classified by the ANCA. So not only will the introduction of CA, or conditional access technology, destroy free-to-air broadcasting, but all broadcasting-related services in the country, including television advertising, and the industries that rely on it because the several needed eyeballs or viewers will be restricted from the continuous viewing of free-to-air television against their rights. GIBA has indicated in other fora that it is not opposed to the idea of raising revenue to support the operations and maintenance of the national DTT infrastructure. We have in fact preferred more efficient and cost-effective alternatives for the collection of revenue which is tried and tested and accepted worldwide and does not infringe on free-to-air TV services nor individual rights of the viewers. But this appears not to have been considered in view of the recent disturbing publications coming from the National Communications Authority, which is seeking to implement the provisions of the Ministry's Ministry of Communications draft policy document. The publication was an instruction to the general public, and let everybody hear this. Probably a lot of people didn't see the publication in the newspaper. In fact, the publication was first uh, uh, launched on the Facebook page of uh, NCA on the 1st of April. And some of us were believing that it is not true because 1st of April was an April Fool's Day. But on the next day, on the 2nd of April, this publication was made in the Daily Graphic newspaper. So this publication is instructing the general public not to patronize the NCA certified set-top boxes and integrated digital TVs which conforms to the legally gazetted standard of the Ghana Standards Authority GS1099. So the public was also, note, the public notice also directed dealers like Hisense Hitachi, NASCO, and so on and so forth, LG, Sony, and all of that, to stop manufacturing type-approved receivers, causing financial loss, and this is a big issue. To further compound the problem, my president hinted on the seven-member board, and I also mentioned it. So in addition to this control, creating a monopoly for the reception devices, it further went to talk about the seven-member board which will be constituted or appointed by the president. And here again, Giba disagrees with this policy which will allow the appointments of the board members of a single monopoly DTT infrastructure company to be vested in the president instead of the National Media Commission in order to insulate the broadcast media from governmental control. These are matters that should concern every Ghanaian citizen and hence the initiation of this public forum. It is our hope that the discussions will be held dispassionately and towards finding the best way forward in successfully completing the digital switch over and to forestall any further delays of migrating the broadcasting sector. Once again, free to air television must remain free as classified and authorized by the NCA, the regulator. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, another round of applause uh, for Prince Harry Crystal. Um, at this juncture, I'd like to make uh, another, just reiterate that we're live on more than 200 radio and television channels across uh, the country and affiliates around the world. Uh, the channels include the Joy News channel on the multi-TV platform, as well as the City TV channel on the multi-TV platform, GH1 Net 2, 
UTV, TV3, OKFM, OK Oman FM, Star 103.5 FM, CT 97.3 FM, Joy 99.7 FM. Uh, we're also on channel 362 and 421 on the DSTV platform and 178 on GoTV, as well as on and via Star FM Online, City Newsroom, and MyJoyOnline.com, as well as affiliates across the country and around the world, and on the Gibber Facebook page. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of um, key stakeholders in the industry, uh, right on the government side, legislature, uh, Mr. Sam Nate George. Um, is the MP for Ningo Pram Pram and a member of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Communications. Mr. Uh, Ernest Boating is the Vice President of GIBA and from the Global Media Alliance. Uh, Mr. Godwin Avanogbo, a veteran broadcaster and a consultant. Uh, uh, you also have a representation from the National Communications Authority as well as GIFEC in the person of uh, Mr. Abdul Latif Amadou and from the Broadcast Fraternity, uh, Mr. Kwabna Anochi Adisi. Uh, of the EIB group. Uh, Stella Wilson, um, a Japong also from Ken City Media, Samalata Mensa from Omni uh, Media Limited, operators of uh, City FM and City TV, and uh, Mr. Kwesi Chum of the Multimedia Group. I uh, will bring you more acknowledgments in a moment uh, as uh, we proceed. At this point, um, our second presentation uh, will be uh, done by a, a man who uh, has been working on this right from the beginning. Um, he's seen the journey of the digital uh, migration right from the UK, uh, from his experiences at the uh, ITU, and um, I'm sure that he'll bring us some interesting perspectives that uh, we ought to consider as we make our own journey. Um, so Gregory uh, Bensberg uh, is the general manager of Digital 3 and 4. Um, the, he, this manages the broadcasting of ITV and Channel 4, uh, both of which are uh, digital terrestrial services in the UK. And uh, he previously worked as a policy and technical expert at Ofcom, which is uh, the UK's version of the NCA. And. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the man knows his uh, onions, and uh, so let's uh, welcome him with a round of applause. You can Google the rest of his information. <laughs> there you go, sir. Thank you very much. Right, I might just move these microphones out of the way. We seem to have quite a lot piling up here. I'll put them down here. So thank you very much for that introduction and also for the kind invitation to um, speak to you today. Um, I'm obviously not deeply embroiled in Ghanaian politics and the broadcasting policy. What I've been asked to do is more give you some context of the sorts of issues which you're facing now have been managed in different parts of the world, specifically in the UK, um, but also within the European Commission who regulates and imposes regulations um, on broadcasters across Europe to manage these sorts of issues. So um, what I'm going to do first of all is just talk a little bit about international context and I think that's important um, because whilst you're facing a very specific issue to do with conditional access and encryption of your services, the broadcasting environment around the world is facing massive pressures and I guess it's, it's always worth remembering that those pressures will not go away and it's important that you're strong enough to be able to resist those. So having situations which weaken you, um, diminish your audience, make products more difficult or expensive, um, probably makes it more difficult for you to fight back against the rise of people like Netflix and Amazon. I'll then talk about some case studies um, which we found in the UK and this is specific about how integration of technical solutions and set-top boxes can limit markets and, and actually make the things more expensive and difficult to manage and draw some conclusions at the end. And at some point we'll move. No. Let's try this and see if 
if it's the direction in which you're pointing. Yeah. Okay, we have a remote, <laughs> a remote operator. Don't we? So if you go to the next slide, could you? So um, key, the key point I want to make here is, is the fact that live broadcasting is under massive pressure um, from around the world. Um, that said, um, in the UK, the amount of actually live broadcast content being viewed by people has actually remained moderately unchanged over the last five years. So whilst we've had the growth of video and demand, had the growth of these global players, the actual impact on UK viewing so far has been modest. The reason for that is that the UK broadcasters actually were prepared and, and, and preparing themselves for the ability to compete with that, providing their own services, but also making their own content compelling and attracting audiences into the, into the, um, um, into the um, market. The issue which actually is affecting people more is the pay television companies who are being threatened by the growth of VOD services, and certainly in America, cord cutting as it's called, people cutting the cable subscription they've got and going over to um, effectively on-demand video on demand services um, has meant that the actual impact on the pace market in America and starting to see in Europe is actually quite increasing. So the key point on, on this really is that the fangs, these you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apples and all of that, are posing a massive threat to both broadcasting in pay but also advertising revenue, and the important thing for all broadcasters around the world, especially free-to-air broadcasters, is being able to be strong enough to compete back um, to them, make sure you have a compelling proposition, make sure that your market actually is open and able to respond to these threats as they come along. Um, this is, um, there's some slides here which are detailed, I won't go through them, they're for reference, so if people want to look into those later on, they're very welcome to do so. This is just showing the impact of different, uh, the different markets around the world. The, um, at the bottom you can see the country, so we have UK, we have Nigeria over here, we have China. What this shows really is that there's a wide divergence of, of how different countries operate television services. They all have free-to-air tiers within them. Some are packaged within satellite, some packaged within terrestrial. Some are starting to see growth of IPTV. Some still, as you can see, um, have analog terrestrial, Nigeria and Brazil um, amongst them. So we have quite a diverse range of, of, of broadcast offers around the world. Um, but what we actually do have is, is quite a mixture and, and, and a compelling mixture of all these markets exhibit between having a strong free-to-air component of the service and a strong conditional access driven pay element of the service. So I think that's the main message I want to get across from, from these sorts of slides. This is more statistics about the UK. If you carry on going, and again, so we go through all of these to the next section. That's right. And again, and onto the next slide. So, so that was a slightly bit of context, and say so those slides are there for reference later on. Um, what I wanted to do a little bit was just talk about how conditional access works, because it's quite important to understand how the system would operate, and if you're a free-to-air broadcaster, how that would affect your, your service. We've obviously already heard a lot about the set-top box needing to have the conditional access equipment built into it, requiring new set-top boxes and all of that. What you've also got actually is quite a lot of equipment and, and new systems being required to operate at the head end, where your playout is, where your input and transmitters are. Um, these all have to be consistent, compatible with the CA system which is being used. They all require, generally, a single person to operate a conditional access system. So the thing about CA, to be secure, it's got to be controlled by one entity. It's got to be put in a very secure environment to make sure that it's not pirated, people don't get access to illegal um, smart cards and all of that. What that generally means is that when you've actually got a, a system, oh, I've got it here, got a system here where you've got the scramble and the control word insertion, which is all the elements which actually encrypt the service, you've got to get your content to that point. The most likely scenario, I would think, is that that point will be somewhere in a CRA, and therefore all content which happens to be encrypted and scrambled would have to be delivered to this point to get the scrambling done. You may have one or two other points around the country, but it's an important thing to note is that you've actually got to get content to this point and then back to your transmitters again, which will add quite a lot of complexity to the process. So this is an additional thing to think about, as well as the issues to do with set-top boxes and costs and all of that. Um, when we're talking about conditional access, there's quite a lot here about how the thing works, and again, I won't go into that in the interest of time. If we go on to the next slide. Um, 
Key thing, go up actually, back, back to that one. No, the third party content one, sorry. If you, that coverage of free aid, yep. So, key thing on, on when you've got a conditional access system is how do you carry different sorts of content? So, um, some countries actually have situations where they regulate the governance of how these services are carried and paid for. The UK specifically did that. Sky, who was the dominant pay TV operator in the UK, um, wanted a transition to digital, digital satellite services in 1998. And the ITC, who I was a, a part of at that time, put regulations in place to make sure that when Sky did conditional access services, um, it made sure that it only charged customers of those fair reasonable um, um, rates, but also made sure that they guarantee that anybody who wished to have access to the service could do. Um, that was important to make sure you didn't have one company dominating the conditional access services, the provider of this technology, didn't actually exclude competitors from, from the market. So that was a very important first element of that. When you're trying to put free-to-air into a conditional access system, it's more complicated because, as we say, I've got these three options of how free-to-air operates. The very first one here, if you put free-to-air services in the basic tier of your conditional access service, they are no longer paid, they're no longer free, and therefore we've lost that benefit of having easy access to the services. So in terms of Ghana, that wouldn't make any sense, because actually people have to pay doubly to get the services. The more normal scenario would be the second option, where we have free-to-air services are available without charge, but viewers are required to get an authorised set-top box and an authorised smart card. And this is a situation which I understand is being proposed for Ghana. Um, that means you do have complexity, set-top boxes, smart cards, authorizations have to be done all the time. You need quite a lot of oversight and infrastructure to manage that. Key issue from that, which we'll come on to in a minute as well, is that once you've started to do that, the set-top boxes you have in your market are proprietary to your market, and therefore you cannot just buy a set-top box of television from around the world. And we have quite a big experience in the UK of introducing this sort of market entry when DTT was first launched, not working very well at all, and I'll come on to that in a minute. The final option, um, which is more, which is once it's much more open and much more flexible, is that free-to-air services can be available in set-top boxes, and they don't need a smart card to be authorised. Um, so basically, the, 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 they're not encrypted. You can have a set-top box which has the encryption for the pay services or for the limited services, but other services are not required to do so, and that's very easy to manage on a set-top box design process. So of the three, the more open and the easiest way to operate it is, is the bottom one. Um, it, it allows conditional access to be adopted for those people who wish to have it, but it doesn't require mandatory um, action, action for that for everybody to do it. Go on to the next one. Another thing um, to do with not just conditional access, but also digital television is EPG listings. Uh, and and it's, a, it's an important element, again, of access, but also prominence about the role. Um, EPGs are the main way most viewers, certainly when going into digital for the first time, can find out what's on. Um, EPGs require the broadcasters to provide information about their content, the schedule, up to seven or eight days in advance maybe, and some operator to, to manage and coordinate that. So quite often the CA provider and the EPG provider end up being one and the same person. So I think a very important question to ask is if someone is managing the conditional access services, what is their policy on EPGs, what's their allocation policy, what's their charging policy on that? And if we go down to the next slide, this is an illustration of how the UK's EPG operates. This is Freeview Play, which is a, a new version of Freeview being launched in the last few years in the UK. It's an interactive version with free-to-air. Key point I want to point out, though, is at the top of the EPG, we have the main public broadcast channels. Uh, and that's actually a regulation, again, which Ofcom put in place, and that requires EPGs have to make sure that the main public services are given prominence on EPGs and given open access on all platforms. So that's a way which the government have put in place to ensure that public broadcasters um, have um, a, a good access to all the viewers because they actually are delivering public benefit rather than just commercial benefit. Okay. So this is the case study I was going to talk about for the, DT, for the UK. Um, in the UK, we launched, as you, as you probably know, DTT, the first in the world in 1998. Um, there were six licenses awarded by the ITC, as it was at that time. Um, one of them went to the BBC, one of them went to Digital 3 and 4, which is now who I actually happen to work for, and that carried the main commercial public service broadcasters around, across the country. Um, the remaining four licenses effectively were commercial licenses, and they were available for lots of broadcasters who wish to buy capacity onto the market. Those licenses were awarded, the three of them were awarded to a company called On Digital, which is owned by ITV uh, at, at that point. Um, and what they planned to do was do a pay service. So they wanted to do a pay service and they wanted their set-top boxes to incorporate conditional access um, in that to allow them to charge uh, viewers for pay services. 
But similar to the model I mentioned earlier on, the free-to-airs just went straight through with no requirement for encryption. So we had that model at the bottom where free-to-air were unencrypted, the pay were encrypted. Um, and we go to the next slide. Um, however, there was, a, there was a problem with this um, in, in that at launch there were very few DTT products in the market. Because on digital were basically subsidizing set-top boxes to drive the market, they insisted that set-top boxes included their conditional access. And what we found was that manufacturers were very reluctant to support the products into the, into the UK market. So products were very expensive and quite limited range of services available. Um, that wasn't the only problem for ITV Digital, it was one of the problems, but it meant that the market didn't grow very quickly. I think they had about half a million subscribers within about three years of launch, but it really wasn't enough. They made some fairly um, adventurous investments in football rights, which was probably the bigger cause for, their, for them going bust, but they did indeed go bust um, in 2002, and the licenses returned to Ofcom and to ITC. So when they collapsed, the, the ITC um, advertised the licenses again for, for, for a new type of operation. Some of the bidders were proposing a very similar pay TV model for those three licenses. Some were being quite brave and saying, well, actually, what we want to do is make everything free to air um, because we think everything beaten free to air would give a much greater range of services to viewers. It would allow manufacturers to put in effectively independent boxes and televisions into the market and allow the market to grow much more quickly. The, the calculation was that if you can get an audience above about a million households, free to air starts paying its own way. The, the broadcasters get enough money from advertising to actually pay for the content they're putting on. Below that, it's very hard. So the, the, the risk was, or the, the calculation was, if you can make everything open and free, the market will go very quickly, and that would actually give critical mass for content to be funded by advertising. Um, and, and that indeed was what happened. Um, so Freeview, as it was called, was launched in, in October 2002. It had a huge impact on the market with a large number of new products coming onto the market within a year of, of the launch. Um, and the entry price of, of tech top boxes. So in on digital, IT Digital's day, they were about 200 UK pounds per box. Um, in about three years after Freeview was launched, they were down below 40 pounds for a set top box. And digital televisions were proliferating. So they were, they were across the entire market segment. Um, and that little, that little um, extract here, this was 2007. Um, this was a press release which actually said that Freeview had overtaken Sky in the number of households which had Freeview as its primary service. So if you go on to the next slide, you can see just about um, on this picture, this is a, a showing the share of market for different platforms in the UK, starting from 2001 and going through to 2013. This one here, the blue, is a digital terrestrial, and this one here, the bottom one, is pay satellite. And what you can see from the launch, well, 2001, DTT hardly grows at all, doesn't move much at all, whereas satellite is growing very healthily. So that means people were converting to digital, but DTT wasn't really having a big impact on that. But from 2002 onwards, what you can see is that DTT starts increasing rapidly in the number of the service, uh, number of households taking the service up. Whereas, ironically enough, satellite levels out and indeed in some point starts dropping. This was dropping around digital switchover when a lot of analog viewers at the last minute were converting to digital and their natural preference was to go for a free-to-air um, terrestrial replacement rather than a pay satellite platform. So what we can see really, one of the, it's, it's, it's quite a big tipping point in the market, is that once the, the broadcasters actually had if once an open market approach to standards, set-top boxes, televisions, free-to-air broadcasting, that market took off um, and, and the opportunities for everybody actually grew sub substantially. So there's obviously parallels to what you're facing in, in, in Ghana in, in that if you limit the technologies and limit the options for how people can participate in the market and you include costs to consumers, it's quite likely that that would slow the market down. And that's why I opened up by talking about the threats the markets are facing because if you're facing lots of threats, not just from your internal competitors, but from global competitors, you need to be very strong to be able to resist them. So having a strong domestic market, to my mind, is one of the key ways of managing that sort of approach. Um, three slides on e-regulations. This is a very legal and very boring subject, unless you're a lawyer, maybe, or a policy expert. Um, so I won't dwell on it too much for you. Um, key things I want to point out, really, is that the, the European Commission um, they, they provide oversight and common regulations across all of the European members. Um, it's important they find that to do that. That creates, in one sense, a level market, but it also imposes minimum standards for how those markets operate. And they've always been very keen to make sure that the broadcast market 
is open and transparent in operation. The people operating gateways, like conditional access systems or technologies, do so in a very open manner. So the first re regulation I was going to talk about was actually introduced in 1995. Uh, and this basically is a TV standards directive. Uh, and it's got a number of provisions. Uh, but the key one is that the um, TV receivers um, have to adopt international standards for transmission of television services. So this was before the standards were actually developed. And I actually was developing the standards in DVB at that time. But it was very helpful that the European Commission said, if you want to launch digital services in, in Europe, you have to standards. And, and as it was, DVB were the only ones in town. So DVB became the de facto standard. Um, what it also required was that I, integrated te television receivers have to have a common interface. Common interface is a means where you can plug in conditional access functionality to what is an open standard receiver. Um, it's a way, basically, for people upgrading television receivers or set-top boxes to have conditional access if they wish to do so, but doesn't require them to actually fit it in in any particular place. And the common interface standard is a standard, public standard. It's a very easy thing to adopt and not too expensive. And therefore, this was, a, this was thought to be a way whereby conditional access providers didn't have to embed their technology into products to make them available. Um, and, and thirdly, the, um, when broadcasters are operating conditional access systems, and, and the European Commission um, made specific things about technical services, these are the encryption services, the methods of entitlements, the management of smart cards, the driving of markets. When operators do that, they were required to offer all broadcasters technical services on this FRND. So FRND stands for Fair, Reasonable, and Non-Discriminatory Basis. That means they can't favor their own services, that the prices they charge customers have to be relating to the costs and the benefits incurred. They can't be um, disproportionate for that. So that was a very important setting of the market, how the market should operate um, going forward. Go on to the next one. So this was repealed in 2002, but replaced with a, a new framework directive, and that effectively put in much more general competition approaches to these sorts of issues. Um, so whilst the principles were intact, they, they took away the specifics because the market was diverging um, quite quickly at that point. Um, but one thing they did say, additional to that, was if you're doing interactive services, you have to operate those in a very similar manner as you have done for broadcast services. So it was preparing the ground to saying that just broadcast and, and interactive are important to consumers, and common standards and common approaches are equally important to operate those. Um, and the last regulation I'm going to talk about is the um, um, Universal Services Directive in 2002 as well. Um, and, and what this does and did was allowed member states to actually nominate certain of their broadcasters as effectively essential broadcasters for the country and require all platforms to carry them. Um, these are called must-carry. Um, generally, um, countries select their public service broadcasters to be nominated for that. And what this does, it means that every platform has to carry them. And again, there are words at the bottom here about FRND. They have to be carried on a reasonable basis. Some might say carry free, some might say just on nominal cost basis. Um, but it makes the, the whole point of this is to make sure that everyone has access at no extra cost to free to air services or the public services in all products and all services and all platforms in a country. And that was again very important to make sure that if you're doing a, a platform and a variety of platforms in countries, the PSBs always get through and always get through without any mitigation or anybody in the way of it. So, conclusions. Um, First one, which I started off on, linear TV is under huge pressure from online services. It's, it's, it's maybe not substantial at this stage in Ghana, but it will emerge. The more internet you have, the more people are connected, the more that threat and that, and that challenge will, 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 will emerge. Um, and therefore, it's important to be aware of that and able to, to respond to it. At the moment, certainly in the UK, the public broadcasts are responding very well. Their audience share, their viewers share, their eyeball share is holding up well but it does require a lot of investment. There are threats to the younger audiences they, they hold, and that's one of the issues they're having to think about most carefully with this content, but also making sure that their content is available elsewhere as well. Um, conditional access systems are good for providing revenue streams for pay TV, um, but they can also be used, I think I was mentioned earlier on, to limit the geographical um, coverage of free-to-air services when you've got rights issues and you've only got the rights for certain territories. So CA is a very useful thing for that. That generally applies to satellite, not terrestrial services. And indeed, there are some slides at the back of this pack talking about the UK public broadcasters use CA when they launched digital satellite services originally because the beam width of Astra was too wide. So that's a very useful thing. Um, 
But uh, a key issue about management of CA systems is that you need to manage the regulations in very carefully and be very aware of the consequences of what things can happen. Um, key issue really is people managing CA systems have to operate in a fair manner, a transparent manner, um, and that viewers don't get disproportionately complex systems to, to limit and competitive access. Key lesson from the UK experience is that by limiting set-top box design, um, including additional features, adding cost to consumers, limit that market opportunity, and therefore you'll find you have a smaller market share of those services than if you didn't actually have that. And, and as I say, the free view was very dramatic. The change in how the market responded and the take-up of audience was dramatic in, 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 within a year of Freeview being launched. So you can see there is a consequence of these, and I think that's one of the things which is worth maybe putting to your government to make out that you, know, you, you might damage terrestrial rather than enhance it by doing this. Um, that's all, so hopefully that was clear. I didn't speak too quickly. No one waved at me to tell me to slow down, so hopefully that was all right. Um, but thank you all very much for your time. Thank you very much, Gregory, and uh, I think he deserves another round of applause uh, for a non-technical person. Uh, you did make a lot of sense, so um, I think um, he did justice to the subject matter. So we're going to go into our panel discussion in a moment, but before then, um, a very recent engagement uh, or an interview um, on a program at GH1 um, involving. Uh, the two Georges, one is uh, a first name and the other was a, a surname. Uh, so there was an interaction between the Deputy Minister of uh, Communications, Mr. George Ander, and uh, Mr. Samuel Nate George. Um, and so we're just going to uh, watch that briefly and then I'll hand over to Bernard Avler who will handle the uh, discussion on the panel. Uh, but it gives a certain context of where we've come from and where we are now, and hopefully we can find a way from here. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, watch this next video. But you're making it better. Okay, now, with all due respect, my colleague Sam George saying that there's no engagement with stakeholders as far as the DTT is concerned. Yes, let's, let's move there in wrapping <laughs> yeah, yeah. up. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me just read it for, for those who who may not know the story, quickly, before you coming. Uh, so, free to air TV in danger if communications ministry implements DTT access control policy. And uh, I saved this for the last, because you are the deputy communications minister. He's a member of the communications committee in parliament. So, um, quickly, quickly. Okay, so the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association has kicked against the Ministry of Communications policy to block... Um, free-to-air television content in the country. According to the association, if allowed, the policy would wipe away FTA public service broadcasting, which is the free-to-air, and the public's right to freely access free television programming. And Ghanaians' households who rely on it exclusively would lose out. A statement issued by Geba said it had engaged the Ministry of Communications, the Ministry of Information, the National Communications Authority, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Communication and other stakeholders over the years with no response or attention to the concerns it raised. Geba would like to reiterate that it was not part of the meeting of the Ministry of Communication to finalize the policy document as stated by the minister. So they weren't. Well, you see, and I, get, I started by saying that it is not true that stakeholders have not been engaged. Okay? Now, there was a draft, or there's a draft policy that was circulated to all stakeholders. All stakeholders were given a time to submit their written, applica uh, their written submissions. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, as of the time that the ministry took a decision to meet with all stakeholders, Giba came and said that one, of, one or two of their members were not going to be available. However, the members of GIPA who are on the DTT platform okay, were present in that meeting. Okay? So, so it's, like, it's like Sam George, uh, he runs a school. He, he's having a PTA meeting. Then you are the chairman of the PTA, but your children are not in that school. And you say that you cannot go. But me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a parent there, and my child is in that school. 
between you and I, who has a better interest in the decisions that are going to be taking place? And indeed, that meeting was held. Every other stakeholder was there. Every other stakeholder was there. Okay. And indeed, hold on, hold on. And indeed, in Gibbon's submission, there is nowhere in Gibbon's submission that they suggested that the consideration for having conditional access was problematic. Okay, so we cannot keep on taking five steps forward and then two steps back. Okay, okay uh, so for, for so the benefit of our viewers, Ms. Uh, uh, Honorable Land, I want you to explain to us what this whole DTT thing is about, Some before you come in quickly. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole topic on this one. Okay, in, in okay. So, so, so basically, in line with the international convention, we are switching over from analog TV broadcast to digital TV broadcast. Right. Now, that would free up a um, significant amount of spectrum that is being underutilized or not effectively used under the analog regime. When we go through the digital regime, we'd have a better use of national spectrum. And that spectrum can then be put back into other sectors of the, of, 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 of the communications industry. It can go into data, it can go into voice, etc., etc., etc. So it started from their administration. They, they started um, through KNET to build a national DTT platform. Okay, over 42 sites have been built across the country. Um, has 40, 40 channels that you can plug in and broadcast as a head end that has been built. We, we, we're finishing up that work. So now, if you have digital content, all that you have to do is to take your content and then plug in. You don't have to build your own transmission. You don't have to invest in transmission. So the, the game of the day now is content because the government is taking care, care of, of the infrastructure as far as transmission, uh, transmission is, is concerned. Now, there's also the TV license okay, which is the law, okay, which requires for people that have access to certain devices that view content um, to pay a certain fee. I think it's 36 CDs, 36 CDs a year. Now, because of technology, there is an opportunity to use technology to, um, to recover or to manage um, this TV license um, collection. Okay, and that is exactly what we are doing. And okay. again, and again, this is a draft policy. Okay, I mean, it hasn't it hasn't yet been 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 approved. Okay, it's still it's still a discussion that is taking place. So it's quite premature for Giba to uh, for Giba to find space in Daily Graphic. And what I've expected Daily Graphic to have done was to have called the minister, or to have called somebody from the ministry. Okay, for the ministry side of the story before putting this on front page. Okay, we waste a lot of time. This, the same thing happened when when we're doing this um, uh, 300 community satellite TV project where Giba went and all the all, on, on all the airwaves and we're saying that the government is handing over the management of the national DTT platform to a Chinese company. Okay, his constituency benefited. Why didn't he tell his constituency his constituents that he didn't want the the the, the Star Time satellite TV project that we're going was coming to his constituency? Okay, so okay, Giba, so Giba, Giba, Giba is misinformed. Is misinformed. Okay. Yeah, okay. Giba is misinformed. Uh, uh, he says Giba is misinformed. He says that all the stakeholders were engaged, but uh, Giba's concerns valid from where you sit. Well, <clears throat> I think what's going to settle this is, and I'm happy I'm here with him. I wouldn't want to use the use the word open challenge, but I think it will help this discourse if the ministry would make available to the committee on parliament the minutes which will have the attendance of that final meeting. Because the minister is on record to have said that I was present at that meeting, representing Parliament's Select Committee. Except, where, where did she say that? Well, she said that to me and she said that to the committee chairman. We've had conversations on this. And she said Giba was present. She actually mentioned Chief Crystal Jiraco yeah. as being present at that meeting. So I, I'm no, coming. No, and that's no, why, saying, me, and that's why, and that's why no. Giba, I'm coming. No, I'm no, coming, no. no. There were series, it's, it's important that I make this no, intervention. No, but Giba is talking about the final. The final yes, 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 it's the yes, final meeting. He's talking about the final meeting. So, 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 so there's would no way that the minister would say that Giba, Giba as a body was present at the... So you have been watching a forum by the Ghana Independence Broadcasters Association. Now they are registering their displeasure against a proposal by the Ministry of Communication to introduce conditional access when it comes to free to air television. The argument by the Communications Ministry is that everybody is moving from 
analog to digital television. And so it's time now for Ghana to also do that so that we can be able to have a lot of freed up space which have been, been used over the years. But Geba is arguing that this movement is not going to go right when it comes to access to television. Earlier, we heard from the president of the Ghana Journalist Association, Roland Afelmoni, who explained why the introduction of the conditional access will not be right when it comes to the proper practice of journalism. We also heard from an independent broadcaster who is Harry Crystal from the Crystal TV, who also explained why this introduction of conditional access will not be right for the viewer because if broadcasters are already paying for space, the viewer should not also be taken through going to pay again to access free-to-air television. And then we heard from an international broadcaster who is Gregory Densberg, who also explained how over the years it has been practiced elsewhere other than Ghana. So let's go back to the Alisa Hotel and listen to the panel discussion. We have a lot of experts when it comes to the practice of journalism and then how it has been introduced or practiced elsewhere and what Ghana can learn from the introduction of the free to air, of the introduction of the conditional access when it comes to free to air television. You're still watching TV3 and we're live on DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Sari. We're back shortly to go back to the Alisa Hotel for the continuation of the forum by the Ghana Independence Broadcasters Association. You are still live on TV3. We are also live on DSTV channel 279. We'll take you to the Alisa Hotel where the Ghana Independence Broadcasters Association is holding a forum explaining why the Ministry of Communication should not go ahead with the introduction of the conditional access to free-to-air television. is how the cookie crumbled uh, and uh, like I said it does give some context to um, where we've come from where we are and hopefully this engagement will allow us to chart a new course to uh, the end that we all desire I'd like to hand over at this point uh, by inviting mr. Bernard Avler who is the uh, city breakfast uh, show host as well as the general manager for city TV and city FM let's uh, welcome him with a round of applause thank you Thank you very much, Inshira, and good uh, morning or good mid-morning to all our listeners and viewers across the various platforms. This is a, a very important industry conversation to try and bring clarity to an issue which has very often been obfuscated by technical jargon. And I, I want to say that even here we've not been that kind because I listed over 10 different um, is it acronyms, DTT, EPG, FTA, OTT. UHF, VHF, STB, I don't know whether it's STB Macan or STB, the other STB, you know, and then there's FRND, you, you also added more. <laughs> and then there's one that I couldn't even understand, NDBMTC. What about these things mean? I don't know. We'll break it down. It's a program that's meant to throw light, so it's not just a panel speaking and talking at you. We have a nice audience who will ask more questions for clarity's sake. So who is on the panel? So some of the speakers are on the panel. So earlier on, we had uh, Prince Crystal. So please come up, put your hands together for him. He's coming up again. He is the execu he's an executive council member of GIBA, and he is a director of operations for Crystal TV and a commissioned mem commissioner member of the National Media Commission. And he's the chairman of the Legal Regulatory and Ethics Committee of GIBA. So great to have you, Prince Harry Crystal. We also have the man who gave the gl British context and the European angle, Gregory Bensberg. Greg, you need to come back. Thank you very much. He's the general manager and, um, of Digital 3 and 4. And this manages the broadcasting of ITV and Channel 4, Digital Terrestrial Services in the UK. P previously worked uh, as a policy and technical expert at Ofcom. And if you know anything about television regulation in the UK, Ofcom is a very important uh, body. So thank you, Greg, for being here. We also have um, a legal context. So in analyzing the issue, there's a legal aspect, there's an engineering aspect, there's an economics market industry structure aspect, and then there's a media freedom aspect. So we're very happy to have, um, I think, the youngest dean of a law school in anywhere in the world before he 
became the age he is now. <laughs> so we still have the record. Uh, Kofi Abuchi is also managing partner of Access Legal Solicitors. Kofi, thank you for being here. I want you to be closer to me. I need you to be closer to me. So that when the picture is taken, I'll look nice. <laughs> Kofi, thank you. You're you not in bow tie today. You're usually in a bow tie. Kofi, great to have you on the program. And we're privileged to have, as I said, the issue has a very important global context. So access to media is part of media freedom. And indeed, Al Jazeera published an article a couple of days ago about how global media freedom is fading. And some of the country context, it was about whether you can put on your television at all. Who controls the space? So media freedom is not just whether a journalist is short or not. If you can't access TV in an affordable manner, it's media freedom. And because that aspect of the conversation is very important, we invited two heavyweights. So Chairman for Life is here. Uh, he is Kwesi Jana Pinting, who is the Nana Kwesi Jana Pinting, former chairman of NMC. He's on the panel. Nana, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for him. And uh, last but not least, we also have the vibrant executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa in the person of Suleiman Brahman. Suleiman, thank you for being here. You, you just had your salah yesterday, so you should be re resting, but you are here for God and country. So uh, listeners here and viewers, we want to put the issues in context. So as I said, uh, the industry has legal issues and law is the foundation for everything. So we need to understand what are the legal issues here. Listening to what the panelists, uh, the, the speaker said earlier. So there's a process that will kickstart in 2006. 2010, cabinet approved something. There's supposed to be a draft policy by or alleging that government is implementing or making announcements, drawing from a policy that is draft. Okay, what does that mean? We are told that the body that's going to manage the DTT platform is supposed to have certain composition. We're told that as it stands now, that composition is not properly being followed. And what are the dangers of having a, a government-controlled manager of a platform that's supposed to be like an arbiter? So those are some of the legal questions we, we have. And another question in my mind is, is digital migration a government-led or government-driven process? Government-led, so that government leads by industry determines or government leads and drives. And I'm looking at the legal guy because you need to set the legal foundations for us. And your own thoughts about the way we are going about all the legal issues here. Then I'm going to come to the industry chief, uh, Prince. You need to come back to us, okay? So what government wants to do in terms of, for example, the conditional access within the DTT platform, how is that going to affect the players in the industry? You need to be more specific. Who is going to be affected? Is it the regular TV stations? Is it the device importers? Is it the viewers? How is it going to change the economics of the platform? So how is the policy going to read? Re redefine the industry. You need to explain that without any jargons. I don't want any more jargons. I'm tired of your jargons. And, and I'm going to ask Greg to give us a more sort of softer comparison. Okay, which other countries have done this? How did they do it? Has any country had, I mean, we've, we've missed the deadline like three times. Is, is Ghana a, 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 an outlier or this is how it happens everywhere? Because I was somewhere in 2015, I was told the deadline is 2015. Now it's 2020 something. It's maybe 2030. By the time I'm an old man, we've still not migrated. Talk to us a bit about how it happened. And then Chris, uh, Nana Kwesi and then Suleiman. I think what is, why we've brought you here is to talk about what this means for independent media. What this means for independent media. So I've said the questions for everybody. Does that make sense? Good. So let me start with uh, 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 Prof. Since law is the foundation for everything, <laughs> so, I want your own observations generally about the issue from a legal perspective. And then if you can answer some of the questions I've asked about, for example, why are we making directives from a policy that we consider to be a draft policy? And things like that. The body that's supposed to manage our digital platform, why is it putting a conditional access in there? Is that going to deprive people of their right to free television? General thoughts. So please put your hands together for Kofi Abuchi again. Well, clap if Clapping for me before speaking is a very dangerous <laughs> thing to do because you asked me to say something sensible. Um, so it's, it's a murky area, and I think you actually put it in context. We've been here before. The Constitution was adopted in a certain political context, and the tensions of the 90s resulted in many cases that, was alluded, that were alluded to earlier. We've had contests between government and private media houses over the years. Um, actually, interestingly, the current government was then as a party in opposition in those days. 
um, the party that actually spearheaded many of those decisions. So in an interesting historical twist, we have a situation in which that government, that party in power now, um, appears to be the one, the giver is contesting on issues relating to information. So there's some element of historical irony in that area that is assuming that you indeed have a good case, assuming that Giba indeed has a good case. Ghana has been here before, and we've had situations where radio stations have been closed down, we've had situations where radio stations have been refused licenses, and we've been back in courts over the years, and I think generally the media space would concede that a lot of progress has been made. We now have a significant migration and a transition that is creating another difficulty, the extent to which we are able to resolve this properly will determine the future of radio and television and to an extent even print media in Ghana. So we are in a very important stage as far as the future of radio, television, and print media is concerned. Now the reason this is important bipartisanly, and I say bipartisanly because um, whichever party comes into power in future, whether it's the NDC that remains in power or the NDC comes, or some other unknown party comes, that party will be confronted with the foundations that are laid today. So the prospects that beckons and that awaits every other political party for the future it is or may be determined by what is happening today. So that's why this is extremely important. Now to the question of unpacking the law. I see three key things. The Constitution actually provides in Article 21 that everyone has the right to information. In my opinion, that is a foundation, that is a bedrock. Media provides that information. Whatever spectrum or rather whatever uh, facility is put in place to, as it were, obstruct that information may therefore ordinarily raise questions for answer. So everyone has the right information. That's the first one. Now, if you go further into the Constitution under Article 163, impediments to the establishment of media houses are not allowed ordinarily. So if you put that together with the right information, then one can say that ordinarily, each and everyone has a right to set up a media house, be it radio, television, or print, and that person or entity should not suffer impediment ordinarily, trying to make it as simple as possible. However, there was a decision in our court when a challenge was brought as to the relevancy or the legality of imposing a licensing requirement to the establishment of the media houses. And the courts, on practical grounds, decided that because there is a limitation to the spectrum, because there's a limitation to the media, you know, the, uh, what, I don't know how to describe that, but the spectrum, because there's a limitation to the various um, media by which information can be transmitted not everyone can ordinarily just go set up a media house um, and, 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 you know, and then so be it. That there must be a minimum licensing regulatory option for the states. So the Supreme Court qualified that right that ordinarily you and I could have to just set up a media house, so to speak. Therefore, licensing has been accepted over the years. And I'm saying this for us to understand that restrictions or limitations are ordinarily allowed. Now, in, the, in coming to this conclusion, the Supreme Court mentioned something, and I'll probably end here for others to also have their bias. I'm sure we can come back again for the legal conversation moving forward. But the Supreme Court then qualified it with another provision of the Constitution, which is Article 164, which deals with reasonable restrictions that are allowed in a democracy. In my judgment, all that we're discussing will come to that conclusion, i.e. what is called the necessity test. Ne test, sorry, restrictions are allowed. The National Media Commission is a regulatory body. The Ministry of, Informa the Ministry of Communication is a sector ministry. These bodies are allowed to impose restrictions. They are allowed to impose relevant and necessary restrictions. The only qualifying criterion is the necessity of those restrictions. And in deciding necessity, a former judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Databa, said, we have to look among others on the question of discretionary powers. We have to look among others on the rational basis of 
imposing the restriction, i.e., we ask ourselves, are there other alternative means of, doing, of going about the same situation without doing as much damage as this particular measure would have done? If there are other such means, then we should prefer those. If there are no such means, then it means that the restriction that has been imposed, if necessary, is justified because there is no other alternative. So, so, so it, I think it's a great foundation. Yeah. Give me some great foundation. I want to ask you just two quick questions to wrap up the legal part. Two things. We're saying that there is a draft policy which has not been, for want of a better word, ratified by the various stakeholders. And you are taking actions on the basis of a draft policy. That's number one problem. Number two, we're saying that in seeking to migrate all of us to a digital platform from analog, which you all agree and have been part of, you have changed the rules in the middle of the game. You were supposed to migrate everybody onto the digital platform, whether they wanted to be free to air or pay TV. 98.9% .9 of people in Ghana have free to air. But you are introducing a conditional access into the migration process. And we're saying that what that does is that those who used to get TV free have to pay to get free TV. So we're saying two things. So that conditional access requirement, we are not saying don't migrate to digital, but we're saying that the conditional access requirement means that those who used to watch TV as a free to air thing have to pay. So you are forcing and you are restricting free watching of TV. So those are the two things we're saying, among other things. We're also saying the person managing that platform may not be independent, but that's a tertiary issue. So I want you to address those two points. Whether you can start, for example, because they made an announcement in April that people who import devices based on the old system should stop mm. importing those devices. So we are saying that we know you are acting based on a policy which you consider a draft policy, which George Ander confirmed. And number two, in seeking to do that, you are preventing 99% of the people from getting access to free-to-air TV. The second question, and the facts you alluded to and some of the things that have been said here, um, creates a confusion of facts. You know, I heard you say draft policy, and I've heard people say draft policy, but I've also heard directives. So I am not sure whether there is a draft policy or we have gone past the draft policy. I have to be honest about this. I do not have the fullness of facts. And usually when I speak and I do not have the fullness of facts, I always add conditions so nobody can question what I say. So if the policy is a draft policy, then actions cannot be taken on the draft policy because draft is draft temporary in the process of review, consultation, et cetera. So you know, it's, not, it's not completed. So if it is a draft policy, then I do not see how directives have been issued. And you are saying directives have been issued. And I think I heard that this morning as well, that directives have been issued. If truly directives have been issued on the draft policy, then in substance, it is no more a draft policy, i.e. if indeed it is true that directives have been issued. Now, on the other question of whether you can actually um, put restrictions on people making payments, et cetera, as I indicated, Discretionary powers, when conferred on a body, can be exercised by that body. In the case of restrictions on the media, the test is necessity, i.e., is the imposition necessary and justified, i.e., is there an alternative means by which this same policy could have been implemented without that restriction? If there is no alternative means, then it means it's necessary. The only problem, as one can see here, and just from the standpoint of um, my, my, my background as a constitutional law person, I was introduced earlier as someone with expertise on telecoms. Let me say that is not true. You know, so while I thank that person for giving me a future aspiration on, on what I should specialize in, I'm not yet there. I'm not an expert in telecom matters. But in terms of, from the point of constitutional law alone, um, some impositions of levies sometimes come in the character of taxes. And the constitution has a restriction on the imposition of taxes. So whatever, whatever, levy, whatever levy is imposed on citizens that may have the character of taxation, there's a requirement that parliament have to approve it. So again, I'm just unpacking these things for us to have clarity on the issues. If it is, if it is again the case that there's going to be an imposition of a levy that all of us have to pay, then my expectation is that there must be some parliamentary oversight. But as to the necessity, as to the justification, I will not want to make a direct pronouncement on it except to say that some of these things only the court can decide. So I've given the principles. One of them is necessity, or the key one is necessity. Any restriction that is imposed on media rights, any restriction that is imposed on the rights of information, it must be necessary. And in the case of necessity, it means there are no alternatives. That is the best option, and no other option can be resorted to without implementing the policy. I think it's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh
uh, Kofi Abochi. Let me come to Prince Crystal. You are the industry player, and you're, so you are both engineer and business, right? So you're saying there was an announcement in the newspapers that the government or the uh, Ministry of Communication was saying people who import certain gadgets should stop. And you're construing that to be laying the grounds to implement parts of the draft policy which has not been agreed on. Great. Who is going to be negatively affected by this? And why is it such a problem? Is it we, the TV viewers? Is it the people who import gadgets? Is it the TV stations? Explain the various people who will be touched if what government intends to do goes unhindered. Thank you very much. Um, I will touch on this, but I'll quickly go back to the first question you asked about what is the role of government yes. in the whole digital migration process. Now, there are two basic roles. One of them has to do with spectrum dividend, which I would explain. And the other one has to do with the fact that you want to help the consumers or viewing populace of Ghana easily transition from analog to digital. So government has an interest in ensuring that its citizens continue to watch TV un, uh, uh, unhindered, whether in analog or in the transition to digital. Now, spectrum dividend simply means that if you take one to 10 as a scale of preference, and these would represent the frequencies you give to a TV channel, TV3 may be occupying cha channel one or frequency one, but in the analog domain, that would be the only entity occupying that space. But in digital, it will give rise or give birth to many more channels using the same channel one. So what happens is if Ghana should have five channels in all, then in digital, you could have five plus an extra 19 space available for uh, new channels to come on board using the DVBT2 technology. Now, that space that is left between channel two or frequency two all the way to frequency 10 on the scale of preference would be what the government would achieve in reserving space or conserving space. That is what we call spectrum or spectral dividend. So government needs this resource to be able to churn out new services. And as a result, when we migrated from analog to digital, we gave birth to new services such as 4G uh, LTE, long-term evolution. And then we also are looking forward to bringing on board 5G service. So these are things that government has an interest in. Now, coming back to the impact and implications of implementing conditional access in a DTT setup. Now, uh, as I have already alluded to, we have uh, authorization specified for free-to-air broadcasters by the NCA. And we also have another ca category for pay TV. So the primary effect would land on the broadcasters uh, authorization they currently hold because their authorization is meant to serve the people without encrypting the signal and leaving the channels in the clear. So that regardless of whichever decoder or whichever TV set you have, you should continue to watch TV unhindered. But when you do so by introducing a conditional access, then you are creating a monopoly because the conditional access software is a proprietary license that is given to an entity, whether it is government or it is the operator or the BSD uh, broadcast signal distributing entity. What it means is that you are creating a monopoly and everybody in Ghana is to go and get one type of decoder to be able to continue watching TV. So that's an impact. Now, uh, if I dovetail in- As we speak now, uh, different people can buy different decoders to access the content. Yes. But if uh, the directive we saw in the newspapers is to be followed, all those devices can no longer receive free to air. They can no longer receive free to air. Unless you go and add the new prescribed box to what you currently have. That would be the only way you can continue And you're watching. saying that would disadvantage the TV operators, the content providers who are already sending their content to the existing channel. Yes, the reason is because our model 
or free-to-air broadcast model is dependent on the number of viewers to drive your advertising revenue. Not pay subscription. Pay subscription is collecting money from each and every individual for the content they access so that the subscribe, uh, subscriber-based entity can survive. So number one, it will affect you and me. Correct. Who else is going to be affected? The viewers. In what way? Fundamental human rights. Article 21A, uh, 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 1A, says that every individual in Ghana or every individual has a right to access to information and freedom of the media. So when you do so, someone living in Kasena Nankana or Laura District, who is a charcoal seller, who needs to know how he's going to thumbprint the next ballot. When you put in conditional access and he comes home and is unable to subscribe or pay for the TV license or the digital access fee, you are curtailing access to information. Don't forget, he's told you that there's no right which is unfettered. And he's also said that we will determine whether that restriction is necessary or not. So yes. keep that in so, mind. So in answer to that, we have preferred alternatives, about three or four alternatives to implementing a conditional access. And that is why I said up till now, the Ministry of Information and the Ministry of Communications are not discussing those options. What are those options? One, it is obvious that the TV stations who are requiring the services of the DTT platform, let the viewers understand that in analog, every TV station transmits their own programs from whichever location. That is why when you tune your antenna in one direction, you can't receive the other one very clearly. But in digital, every TV station has been put into one house so that wherever you are, you can send your antenna and point to it and you will receive very clean and clear signal. So by so doing, these uh, TV stations that you have uh, put together, um, I'm missing the point, but it has to do, yeah, bring me back. You're saying that when you decide to do digital, it means that it's easier for receivers to get all the stations irrespective of where they are located. That's right. Now you're saying that the conditional access makes it difficult or blocks that free access by having them to pay. That's right. Which is the, the second impediment you're putting in there. That's right. I think that's fair enough. We'll pause it here. Now, now the dealers. Okay, yes. You have authorized... 500 models who go through a rigorous process of certifying their products or decoders or TV sets in accordance with the GS 1099 standard. Standards authority. Standards authority. Now, without consultation, you publish this directive telling them to hold off any further manufacturing of set of buses that have already been certified by the NCA. So there is an issue there. It concerns them. There are How lots large is the industry of these people, how, how many people are involved? Uh, precisely, there are over 50 individual companies. But each company produces different models. It's like you pick Infinix. So you have Infinix 1, Infinix 2, Infinix 3, different models. If you pick LG, you have LG 1, LG 2, so different what's the, models. What's the financial size of that industry? It's huge. A, you a can talk about dollars? We have 4.6 million viewers or 4.6 million households in Ghana who are consuming this product. So you can tell the number of millions of TV sets and decoders that have been distributed onto the market. And, and this is distributors huge. have to go and adhere to the new standard, yes. irrespective of orders they've placed and what they've been Correct. doing, all, all of that. And going for the new standard, there is nowhere in the world that you set a maximum uh, specification. You set a minimum. So adding a conditional access, which is a proprietary product, belonging to one entity as a licensed uh, software provider mm. is a problem. Just finally, I hope this is making sense. Uh, what, what problem do you have with the governance of the process? Because I've heard you say the president will appoint somebody and that person may not be independent and the media commission's role has been taken away. What are you really talking about? The media commission's role is to insulate the media from governmental control. That's one of their uh, mandate. Now, uh, when you have a seven member board and I itemize the membership, six out of those membership are going to be coming directly uh, paying their allegiance to the appointing authority, which is the president. So Giba would be the only one out of that because we are sending a nominee to the seven member uh, uh, board. Who are the other six? So you have the Ministry of Communication, so definitely it's coming from government. You have Ministry of Finance coming from government. The chairperson will be appointed by the president. 
the CEO will be appointed by the president, and someone representing the public would also be appointed by the president. Now, the danger in there is that you are giving full control to the government. Whereas, in 1994, we fought for the liberalization of the airwaves. And 24, 25 years on, we have served Ghana so as the fourth estate of the realm. Practically, how would this affect the performance of that board? So, for example, there's an election going on. And there's a TV station that's notoriously anti-government. Are you proposing that because six out of the seven people owe allegiance to the government, some things can be done by the body that manages the platform Absolutely. to get that channel off? Absolutely. Is that the kind of thing you're seeing? I'll give you an example that happened in 2018 in Kenya. President Uhuru Kenyatta was sworn in as a president of Kenya. And then we saw Raila Odinga also mounting a stage to stage his own swearing-in ceremony. This is, to journalists, newsworthy. But there was a directive given that no TV station or radio station or the print media should carry Raila Odinga's uh, swearing-in ceremony. So what happened is when the TV networks and radio networks carried it, immediately a call was placed to the DTT platform or the managers of the platform, and these channels were shut down. Who manages the platform in that country? Uh, I do not know the name, but it is also within the remit of It's government. a similar arrangement to what it's, this is being proposed it's a, here. It's a similar arrangement. Very interesting. I think you've said enough. That, has it made sense? Can we move on? Good. So now I want to bring in the media governance angle. Okay, so uh, Nana, you've, you've chaired the media commission. You've done media for many, many years. What's going on here from where you sit? What, what's going on? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, actually, I uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I agreed to participate in this in a way to widen the discussion. I know that we are focusing on the issues before us now, but they go further. And, and if we do not seize this opportunity to to make that comment, we may be missing something. Last year, the Media Commission organized a, a press conference at which we sounded the alarm. And that was about the uh, DTT company, the, the digital company that is supposed to be set up by the Ministry of Communication and, and whose composition has already been, been mentioned. We explained that this violated the Constitution in a significant way. The Media Commission considered in its communication that this entity would be part of the state-owned media. Why? Because by definition it's owned by the state and it would be performing a media function if the platform's duty is to enable media communication to take place. Therefore, as the Constitution gives that power solely to the Media Commission to appoint the chair and members of state-owned media entities, this must not be in the remit of the Ministry of Communication. And we said that not responding at that time to this illegality would be going down the slippery slope and more would happen. Now it is happening. So clearly, the issue of media governance, the bigger picture, must come into play. What appears to be the case here is that we have an unfinished business. For, for many decades, the struggle for democracy has had media independence and freedom as an integral part. There can be no democracy without a free and independent media. And therefore, in fighting for the constitution that we had in 92, necessarily, we had to fight for freedom and independence of the media. And this has been guaranteed in the constitution. And a significant part, indeed not a significant part, the entire logic of chapter 12 of the constitution is to get government off the backs of the media. And therefore, to have any ministry using the digitization process as a means to come in 
as indeed the Ministry of Communication appears to be doing, violates both the letter and spirit of the Constitution. Quick question for you. We know from the media that we in electronic media, we say that we have two quote-unquote regulators. No, there's only one no, regulator. No, let me ask my question. Then you answer it. Relax. Mm -hmm. Just relax for me. I am saying that we typically say we have two regulators. From the technical side, the NCA, and from the content side, the NMC. Now, explain to us how the NMC is set up, which makes it a more worthy representative of independence than the NCA. You get my point. Yes. Explain how the NMC is, which makes it a more, uh, how shall I say? Yeah, that's the word. Yeah, the NMC, as you know, um, is a constitutional body, and its independence is guaranteed by the means by which it is composed. So you have uh, journalists, lawyers, teachers, all these as associations representing. There are 18 members, and they come from a, a variety of uh, sources. The government, the presidency, has two reps, and parliament has three of whom one should come from the minority. And then, by some means, the, the, the representative of the Ministry of Women and Children, or whatever the uh, ministry uh, looking after that, of the women, is represented. But in the Constitution, it originally was for the National Commission on Women and Development. And that has changed uh, slightly. But that's about the membership that you can call so there are government. religious bodies, there's independent religious, media, there's independent Giba, media, they're all there. All on the 18. All on the 18. So how do you arrive at decisions? If that, is it the chairman or is it consensus or how, how, do, you, how do you arrive at decisions? Well, as you may, uh, with any such body, you can arise at any decision by consensus, by voting, by whatever. But usually it's by consensus. And, and because the issues that are contested are defined by the Constitution, i.e. the independence and freedom of the media. So there's not a whole range of disagreement. I get actually, the job of the NMC is to guarantee, is the guarantor of Chapter 12 of the Constitution. Now, um, uh, uh, as uh, our lawyer explained, mm. um, you, you may make laws, and the NMC did make an ally which famously was opposed by Geba, and uh, which out of good manners I didn't want to mention, but inevitably we have to comment on, because it would have taken care mm. of some of these issues. My final word would be, which I would come to uh, in a minute, but the point you asked, let us say that, let's explain that the NCA is a government body, completely, and so there is no Competition, the, the NCA is not an independent body. The NCA is not a regulator of the media. There's only one media regulator by our constitution, and that's the National Media Commission, which has been established and given the task of ensuring that we have good content. Yeah, but I need to clarify that the person who gives the spectrum yes. for digital players in the electronic media is the NCA. So even though they are not the regulator stricto senso, we pay license fees of some kind. We are answerable to them in certain technical. So for example, if your frequency is supposed to be FM, you can't go beyond 100 kilometer radius. And the NCA, not the NMC, would bring you to book. So I'm trying to let people who are not in Ghana understand that the way the system is set up, we need to explain that even though you are our regulator, we also have somebody we are answerable to in technical specifications of our broadcasting, Well, which is the NCA. Even that is not true. You see, and I no longer speak for the NMC, okay. but of course I, I know a, a fair bit. And much of what the NCA must do regarding the media, they must do in consultation or together with the NMC, which has not been taking place. And I think for this, it is partly the fault of the NMC for not ensuring that this is done. Even in the issues of um, closing down radio stations and all the rest of them, this must be done with the NMC because the NMC guarantees the, the, the independence and freedom, and that means the quality and quantity of content. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much. 
So far, we're making sense. This is a live event we're organizing at Alisa, trying to understand the uh, data migration process and the future of free-to-air television in Ghana. And it's a broadcast media industry forum. And we have a panel that's trying to break down the issues. So far, we've heard from the legal side. We've heard from the engineering quasi <laughs> economic side. We've also heard from the NMC side. Now, Greg, just remain patient for me. I'll come to you. Suleiman, you are the one who looks at press freedom globally. You are the one who shouts when people are being oppressed. Is this part of the things that the media for this for West Africa is concerned about in relation to media freedom? Or this is a technical issue? Well, um, thank you very much, Bernard. I would want to start my submission with um, a recent development. So I have a friend who is in the military who traveled to Congo for peacekeeping. So um, the wife delivered, the mother came from Sandema um, to, to help take care of the baby. And the mother comes and says, well, I have this interesting program on television in the evening that I would want to always watch. So three consecutive days, he was able to watch this program. Then fourth, fifth, sixth days, the TV is off. And the woman asks you know, the daughter-in-law, what's happening? And this lady says, well, you know, we, we are on the Go TV thing. You know, it's my husband who usually would pay. I don't even know there's something called IC number. I have to pay this. I have to pay that. So the woman says, ah, but I watch this program on UTV. Does it mean that UTV people have stopped working? Because I can't get them. And it had to be explained that, no, they are working, but it's just that the system we are using, we can't get it. And it's like, well, then maybe I would have to want, I want to go back to Sandema to be able to get my, my distance. So this lady calls the husband, and the husband says, well, you know, I cannot pay from here, so just disconnect from the Go TV and plug it to the normal antenna. And then that is done. The woman says, okay, now nah, this is TV, you know. Um, just to illustrate the point that this is what is going to happen. That... Um, UTV will be working, CTTV will be working, content is being produced, because I heard that the Deputy Minister talked about, you know, the business is content, but the, the question is, if you produce content and it cannot be delivered, just as CTTV or UTV might have been, or would have been working, but this woman couldn't access it. So that content that is being produced, for who? If you are producing and people cannot access it. So that is number one. Number two is also to explain the fact that, look, people, as at this stage, don't even know what is happening. The awareness creation is not there. And I like the point that the Deputy Minister made that we shouldn't take one step forward and five steps back. But that is exactly what we are doing in our context here in Ghana. Look, on, on 21st of May, the President just assented to the right to information law. You know, which is supposed to actually make access to information much more freer beyond all, you know, to guarantee further what is provided in the Constitution. But we are at this stage talking about conditional access to television for everyone. Because now, those set-top boxes that are in the system that even allow people, you know, to access free-to-air content, we are being told, look, distribution must cease, no more importation, and we're going to introduce something that would allow for everyone, before you access television, you pay, or otherwise we block you because it is conditional. I think the good thing is that Ghana is not the first to be going through this digital migration process. And we are talking about a national resource, which is a natural resource. We can agree we've ab abused our gold, maybe our oil not too well managed, and so on and so forth. But we've had the opportunity now to ensure that there is proper management of this spectrum, which is a national resource. And because it's a national resource, that is why around the world, there is that caution to every government that in the process of migration, one thing must be clear. Governments must endeavor that in the process, people who are already accessing television would not be deprived. And conditions must not be set to make it difficult for people to continue to access television just because we are migrating. Because the migration process is supposed to present advantages to a country and not disadvantages. And in this case, what we are doing, if we are not careful, that is what would happen. I made the point that Ghana is not the first country. We have the benefit of learning from other countries. In the ASEAN regions, I mean countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, and so on and so forth. Even in Africa, in Kenya, Kenya has made a very you know, um, advanced, taking advanced step in terms of the migration process. And in all these, if you read, they will all point to three key recommendations 
in the migration process. One, a country must have a very clear strategic document that will guide the process. I believe here in Ghana, it started in 2010, and you know, people were on board, and so on and so forth. Number two, that such a document must be developed in a participatory way, stakeholders must be involved, and at the end of the day, these stakeholders must validate and accept it as something that would you know, be efficient for the country. And number three, the people for whom this is being done, the citizenry, must understand and must know about it. As we speak now, I don't know which of these three conditions as a country we've met. And you asked about whether we are concerned, or this is something that relates to press freedom, independence of the media, freedom of expression, and indeed, perhaps it is the most fundamental thing. Because we're talking about a situation when, if allowed, as we are being told now, thousands of people are going to be deprived of access to television. This morning when I was coming in, I saw your billboard, City TV billboard around Hachu. Yes. And you said, this can, you can access, are you watching? You can access us using your digital TV. Just that, not a yes. set-top box. Once I have a digital TV, I should yes. be able to access City TV. But we are being told that no, this time around, it's not just your digital TV. You know, beyond your digital TV, if you, if you have a DSTV decoder or Go TV decoder or whatever it is, no, it won't work. You know, you now have to get another one. And there is a group that has the capacity to ensure that even though City TV is producing, whether you can watch or not depends on whether you pay or you don't pay. I may be able to afford to pay, but what about, you know, my mother, my father, my grandparents in the village, and so on and so forth, who have been used to watching TV, you switch it on, mm. and unless there is mm. doom so, mm. you know, you have mm. your television wow. on. So it's a big freedom of expression issue. It's a big independence of the media issue because... Who is regulating what? Who ensures that I'm able to access? Or who, who makes it possible for me to ab uh, be able to access? And that is why the point about the, the, the board is so critical. The difference between the NMC, NCA, the, the, the director general of, of, the, of the NCA is an appointee of the president. The deputy director general, the board, who chairs the board, all that. But if you take the National Media Commission, you know, this is an independent entity. Uh, NAT is there. School of Communication, GIJ, and so on, they have a representative. Ghana Bar Association, somebody is there. Um, GJA, two representatives are there. GIBA, they are there. Muslims Association, they are there. Christian groups, they are there, and so on and so forth. And one cannot say that this, such an institution can be manipulated. But we have, you know, the NCA, which is completely a government creation. In fact, if elections next year, it happens that the NDC wins, for example, the people who are leading the NCA would automatically be changed, just as they were changed when you know, the NDC lost power. And if you have a situation where entities are going to be created, stakeholders, key stakeholders such as GIBA, not fully consulted for them to be on board, and we say, let this go. I don't think that we'll be creating something well, that is worthwhile. Thank, thank you very much. So, so far, we are, we, one of the things that have come out is in attempting to migrate from analog to digital, we are also transitioning from free to pay. You know, so we are using the analog to digital as a pretext for converting free to a, a couple of points for Greg. So, do you understand what we are saying here? Or is this all like something? I mean, and how did it happen in the UK? Did you also have all these kinds of interest fighting before you came to some resolution? Working? Yep. Yeah. So um, it, it is actually sort of using switchover as a way of implementing a different policy, and I think that's come out in a number of areas. Um, I think in the UK, I mean, in one sense, I think what was just being said was, was, was very interesting because it's exactly how we tried to do it. What we had was the government set an objective. We need to switch over because we want a clear spectrum, but also we want to increase the choice for viewers, and also we want to lower the cost of entry for broadcasters. So there was three benefits and the government did quite a complicated cost-benefit analysis to justify the investment required from everybody to do that. So the government set the policy, then the regulator set the objectives for the licensees and how to deliver it. So they set very broad objectives. You know, you must do it by this date. You must do it such that people are informed about the options, informed how to convert. 
the government also put in place a scheme to subsidize, a bit like vouchers you have here, to enable people who couldn't afford to access the services to be given it for free. So there was a sort of a high level policy and implementation approach, but then what happened was that government regulators told the broadcasters to do the plan. You know, it's up to you to think about how you want to deliver that because it's your service. Wow. You understand the network. They told the broadcasters to bring the plan yes. based on the objectives and the yeah. strategy. Yeah. Wow. And then also the broadcasters were told to manage the communication to viewers because they're, they're, it's their viewers. They understand. So the they should manage the communication to their respective viewers. Yes. So they all understand what's going to happen. Yes. Yeah. So we had a delegation and therefore the broadcasters were required to produce the plan, deliver the plan, but also the government put in place a stakeholder framework to provide everybody who was going to be connected to that to be part of the discussions. Now, they weren't making decisions, but they were certainly a very key stakeholder engagement. So viewer groups, for instance, was very important. Disabled groups were very important. Manufacturing industry was part of it. The transmission industry was part of it. So we, we had a very key stakeholder group. We had a lot of power. It reported to ministers. So if they felt they weren't getting the broadcasters to do sensible things, mm. ministers had, and I was in this, this group, every quarter, we had two ministers sitting down with the stakeholder chair, with the broadcaster group chair, with the regulator, which I was at, talking about what's going on. So if people were thinking the process wasn't working, it was taken up to ministers quickly. Ministers weren't concerned about the detail. They just wanted to make sure it was done. And wow. because they're political, they have sensitivity about um, adverse publicity. So they wanted to make sure that people weren't complaining either. So we had a very, it, one says it was quite inclusive, but it was, I think, because the broadcasters had to deliver it, the broadcasters got the benefits, they were required to actually get, get it done quickly. But your, your system, your broadcasters, your broadcasting platform, industry is, uh, the industry setup is a bit different. The BBC is very powerful. And here we have a lot of different broadcasters. But of course, we have the independent broadcasters and then we have the state broadcaster. I'm not sure if it's a comparable broadcasting landscape. The BBC are powerful, but they weren't the only, because the commercial public broadcasters, people I work for now, ITV Channel 4, are very powerful. They have comparable re budgets. Politically, the BBC have a sort of different role. Okay. But I think the broadcasters were very broad-based. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't the BBC dominating. It was consensus. Everyone had to do it. And in the UK, the platform is split. We've got about one-third platform carries public service content. But two-thirds carries effectively the Giba-type type content, straight commercial players who produce content with advertising and, and haven't got any public service requirements. So it, it's, it's not dissimilar, I think, from what you might see here as well. All right. So I think what is clear is that we don't have a government rep here because there are very pertinent questions they have to answer. For example, why are they seeking to introduce the conditional access as part of the platform for migration? Maybe they could explain that in greater detail. So we, we don't know. But I'm going to give Kofi a quick round of comments. Then we're taking some questions because I think now we understand the issue. Viewers, we hope you get the issues. And if, 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 if not, you can let us know. You, you wanted to make a comment when we were discussing the role of NMC versus NCA, feeling that the NMC was a more legitimate, independent rep of the people than NCA, and that kind of thing. Any comment there? Right. But, um, before I I'm not sure this works. So. Okay, it's supposed to work, so it works. I think in the case of the question, before I take that, the question you posed to Greg, um, maybe it would be useful to also contextualize things because the UK is a little bit different from Ghana in some ways, and this may not be too palatable for Gib Giba, but the truth of the matter is um, a lot of the free-to-air stations in the UK may have some minimum degree of public, public broadcasting content. In other words, broadcasting that is governance-related, that is public interest-related. And so there's a reason why probably the emphasis on the payment of money may also not have been a factor in the UK situation, uh, not to mention the fact that the development level of the UK is different from Ghana. Now, the, the point is this. The, I do not think that the payment of a fee of its own is problematic or may be problematic. What is problematic about it is the demographic character of the consumers of the media content in Ghana. I think that was read out. If you have 98 point something percent on free to air, and of that percentage, you have a certain significant percentage of the population who are indigent, who are poor, and who can't afford, then that represents almost a logical way of depriving these people of access to information. And so if you sign a Freedom of Information Act, if the Constitution says there's, an act, there's a right of uh, information, if you put all these together, and at the same time, we have 
um, we have factors that invariably act as a blockade to accessing this information, then that's where one can speak of policy discordance. You know, you have policies that are not in sync with each other. So I, I do see the differences in the UK scenario, but I think it's important for us to also put things in context. Um, I have said before that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, sometimes there are lots of good intentions, but the way we go about them may create problems. I do think that the ministry probably may be well, well motivated. This is a country whose major flagship policy under the government is to go give Ghana, is, is to help Ghana go past aid. And so you can see a situation in which there's an attempt at domestic, um, maximizing, exactly, maximizing domestic revenue in many ways, in every way, in every way possible. And so using the spectrum of media could just be another opportunity of seeing how best we can mobilize re revenue in Ghana as much as possible. So the intention itself may be noble. The intention itself may, need not be bastardized of its own. I do not think that this gathering should be about that. I think this gathering is about finding the best possible ways of not depriving people of information and invariably also depriving people of employment because the GIBA employs a large chunk of Ghanaians and if their businesses go down because the advertisement revenues go down, because consumers go down, uh, there's a ripple effect and mm. ultimately that will affect that. And then quickly just about the, forgive me for that, but just quickly chipping in on the question of the National Media Commission. Again, I think it's important for us to look at the issues carefully. And many of the issues, to be honest with you, we can't complete them here. Consultations are useful, and I'm sure consultations are ongoing. So uh, good faith on the part of both parties are important. We have not looked a lot at media management companies or entities in Ghana as distinguished from media houses. And so the GBC is a media house. The GBC is covered under state-owned media. But an entity that is established that may not transmit content, may not produce content, but only manages the collection of, say, revenue, that entity may not necessarily be a media house. But as to whether that entity is only going to be about the collection of revenue and not doing anything about management of content or you know, the administration of content is another story. But the example that he gave is also notable, the Kenyan example, because it's an example of our time where we have a clear situation in which government was actually able to shut, um, shut media that was not um, palatable or that was not in, in line with their policies, shut them down in the Raila Odinga and um, um, Uhuru Kenyatta scenario. So all these are important things that have to be considered, but from a strict technical point of view, the media house, a media house can be distinguished from a media management house. There are two different things. Except that in Ghana, we hardly have a pure media management house. I suspect that's why that hasn't come up. Mm -hmm. And so if this is going to be purely about the management of media-related thing, as opposed to the production and transmission of content or the mainstream media activity, it's important to probably have Great. an eye on that. So I think I need to come to the audience if you have any questions. So, or any general comments, we'll be very happy to take them. Yeah, I, I, okay, yeah, quick one there. talk about that later. Um, I just think on this one, I have been in the media for many years. I think this media management company and media company kind of thing um, is one that we should not bring in to cloudy or muddy the waters. The thing is this, the media commission, when I was on it, after analyzing the situation concluded that this digital company being set up, to the extent that its main operation, at that time it was not about collecting revenue, is to enable this, this is to enable other television stations to reach their audiences. And if that is its main job, then it should be classified as media. To be fair, the ministry says it should only be classified as infrastructure we differ with them on that. Because infrastructure has to have a purpose. And its purpose is to deliver media. And if that is true, then the Constitution says that that role should be played by the National Media Commission. It is not all about, you know, it's not being unreasonable or trying to oppose the ministry for opposing sake. For the in order that we go forward as a nation, 
We devised a constitution for ourselves, and the constitution clearly set out certain areas for, for based on our history. And it is clear at this point that if we know why the NMC route was selected by the Constituent Assembly and approved in the Constitution, we would see why this is very important. That it's not just a matter of revenue collection and if we want to go beyond aid and then therefore it's a matter of how do we collect money? That's not the point. No, no, my intention is not to make it's, it. No, the if media, we are not Giba, careful. Giba hasn't paid me anything. <laughs> nor has the ministry paid me anything. No, no, I'm, I'm no, just... I know. So therefore, I'm sorry, I apologize. So therefore, normally what I do is that I don't give definitive statements. What I do is to give the two ifs. So what I gave <laughs> were the two ifs. I haven't actually concluded either way. I said if it's a pure management-related activity, Again, and it has to be spelt out, then it's a management company. But if it work will straddle the transmission or any activity which is mainstream media, then it's media. So respectfully, the point is just leave it open. I, I do not know the details because none of you have actually paid me. Yeah, lawyer, I came uh -huh. in because, so, because you were conditional, but I know, you know, you give an if. And I'm saying that on that alone, I know. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. There's a question coming in from a viewer. Question to Harry. Who is covering the cost of DTT and what is wrong with the agency that is investing in the infrastructure dictating the terms? This is a double barrel question to you. It says, ask Harry who is covering the cost of the DTT and what is wrong with the agency that is investing in the infrastructure dictating the terms? You want to take some notes there or you want to answer directly? Go straight ahead. Okay. All right. In the first instance, the setup of the DTT infrastructure was led by government and funded by government. But this resource was uh, harvested from the release of Spectrum. So if you will remember, in the, uh, some few years ago, we had an auction and uh, MTN uh, won for the 4G service. So the money derived from that was what funded the DTT uh, platform. Now, the second mode of uh, sustenance for the platform is for the TV networks who are going to be carried on the platform to pay transmission costs or transmission tariffs to the platform for its survival. Then uh, you also want to uh, look at a third option, which is now being introduced or reintroduced, which is the TV license stuff. So if that should work, there should be other alternatives apart from implementing uh, the conditional access, which eventually would uh, run the business of uh, 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 free-to-air television broadcasts in the country. Thank you very much. This panel has done a great job. Please put your hands together for them. Uh, I want to take any questions or comments, if there are any. So you just, uh, for the sake of our viewers, identify yourself. Please hand him a mic so we know who you are. And then you go straight. If it's a question, you direct it to the person uh, you want. If it's a comment, we are happy to take it. I want to recognize the former uh, minister for the purpose of this program, for communication, Dr. Icospio Gabra. Although he's recently former minister for trade, he was, um, he, he's been instrumental in this ministry that's overseeing this. So if there's time, he'll make a few comments if he has any. Thank you, Doc. So please go ahead. As you start speaking to come, yeah. speak by faith. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy about this uh, session on broadcasting general. Mm. The fact that now we are talking about content being the name of the game. In all the discussion, what I've noticed that creators of content are not recognized. Um, have you seen an input from creators of now that we are moving to content, what part or what provision has been made for creators? Now, uh, um, Article 13 of the, uh, of the uh, EU uh, directive, um, content providers have a right uh, are now obliged to put, put down content that has not been cleared. So if my work is put on a particular platform, 
paid the necessary rights or copyright. Then the, the, the content can be, the platform can be flagged to put out that content. If this DDT migration has that capacity and that aspect, because as much as we are providing uh, content to people, the creators need to be uh, more or less compensated for them to continue providing that aspect of the content. All right. but they are not part of the of the of the discussion. Thank you very much Thank for you. your point. We will address it. Are there any more questions? Yes, there's one here, uh, Mr. Beffy Appinting, an industry person. Thank you. Um, I must disclose that uh, as far back as uh, about 2011, I had presented something like this to government as Director General of GBP, asking for us to use the digital uh, migration opportunity to uh, collect money for, collect the TV license. Uh, you are the one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, Chief Crystal is here, we had a lot of lively discussions on the National Dig Digital Migration Committee on this. I mean, he opposed to my position. The NC opposed to it, uh, but uh, we, we argued. I'm surprised that the NC has now more or less uh, taking up this position. But uh, I think that even as we discuss this now, uh, we must look at the business case or the economics of it. The migration thing has been seen as being led, being driven by government. And even though we would say that government has reaped the digital dividend and invested it in this, it's still government money. So if we, we always look up to government to use public funds to do this, and operationally we haven't sorted out properly how this entity would run, then government is going to find ways to make money. Conditional access is being brought up only as a way of generating revenue. One, uh, to support uh, public broadcasting. Two, to operationalize uh, to operate the entity we may when we do the economics seriously end up finding out that if we want to pay economics for being on the transmission system many of the current broadcasters may drop out so there's need for us to look at the economics critically and then begin to make the argument not only based on the freedom of expression and freedom of uh, the independence of the media, but also look at the business case for this. And, and probably if we expanded the discussion on the other areas, it may be more helpful uh, for, for Thank this. Thank you very much, Mr. Berfi Appintin. We appreciate it. So the economics dimension is always important. Uh, I've scanned the room. Uh, Dr. Ecosio Gabra, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. I would have preferred not to say anything, but once you had identified me, then I guess it's difficult to stay out of the discussion. And actually, before my good friend uh, and brother, Mr. Penting, spoke, I didn't know whether he had been introduced yet, so I was going to introduce him, <laughs> just as you introduced me. <laughs> because I think, among many other things, he's probably one of the few people in this country that has had the privilege of being both a Director General of Ghana Broadcasting, as well as was the Managing Director of the Graphic Corporation. It's a, a double accomplishment in the media. And of course, I want to pay homage to my friends, many of them here, including Mr. Crystal and my solid brother, who is wearing a cap in the back there. He, he will explain to, that to you later. But my main point here is simply to say that Ghana, and I think it's been said by one of the panelists, is a member of at least two very important international organizations that are very interested in this matter. There are several others, but the two that are critically important that Ghana is a member of are the International Telecom Union and the Commonwealth Telecom Organization, where I also had the privilege to serve. And I believe that when countries such as Ghana are going through the challenges that we are facing, it doesn't hurt, um, if this hasn't been done already, for us to seek some support 
and intervention from these global bodies who, as some of the panelists have been suggesting, can draw our attention to the best practices all the way from the case of the Commonwealth, from the Samoa and Toga and Australia, so all the way to Canada, and the ITU, all the 190 or so countries that are members, so that we have a comparative um, understanding of how others have solved this problem in a manner that, yes, we want to have a Ghanaian solution to a Ghanaian problem, but unfortunately for us, the world of media, the world of telecom and the infrastructure that supports it is a global system. So the fiber optics and the satellite you know, communications that um, transmit most of the communications these days, the internet, are not necessarily or are barely owned by Ghanaians or Ghana. We are ourselves beneficiaries of these global in international information technology infrastructure, which drives the content. And so that would be my, my main recommendation here, that whoever is doing this, both Giba and the government of Ghana may seek um, the intervention of these two international bodies just to mm. help us move faster. As CEO of the CTO, we started having digital broadcasting conferences in Johannesburg as early as 2005. And Ghanaians were almost every year being invited to these particular conferences and workshops alongside it, training programs. So there's a lot of knowledge in the country about it. I don't doubt it. But where you, know, you need a referee to help you out with the problem, the international community exists to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take another comment. Actually, two more from the back. And if there's anything you hear that you want to comment on, uh, we'll be happy to. So there's a content question. There's economics question. There's an international best practice question as well. Thank you. So please go ahead with your comment. Thank you very much. Well, one man's uh, former boss, Mr. Appington, has spoken. I've been compared. That why he said will not absorb me uh, for the role some of us have played in this issue. One, the GBC has about six channels. And when uh, this Dr. Adam Moro, former GBC, I'm now retired from GBC, when he raised this issue of the conditional access, uh, he had in mind six of the GBC channels. And he has some background about how this has been implemented. And when GBC started digital transmission in 2018, uh, they have a limited number of programs. Then later, by 2010, they had about six programs running on the DTT platform. Uh, they ran a parallel system uh, with uh, later came KNET, what KNET had implemented, two channels. Uh, our concept was that there should be a nationwide uh, channel, uh, that's channel 28 currently, carrying all the current free-to-air channels with where the GBC channels are. And part of the implementation has been said that sometimes you can restrict the viewing of some of the programs and you make some of them open. And I recall in the current policy document, uh, they have indicated that local content uh, will be carried between uh, 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. And then uh, 6 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. During those periods, you could have almost all the channels open. Or for GBC, for instance, if uh, they had uh, sports, uh, GBC Sports Plus, they could decide to restrict the, the viewing there based on those who pay the TV lancing. But generally, we didn't envisage uh, all the free tier channels to be affected by this uh, CA system. Now, one of the issues we also addressed to government or recommended to them was to separate uh, the, the TV value chain. That's we have content multiplexing and transmission. Some jurisdictions have com uh, actually combined the second two. That's a multiplexing where actually the CE or conditional effect is performed. And then there's a transmission. Transmission is more or less content agnostic. It, does, it means that it just waits and push whatever is brought. Is that the multiplexing level that uh, this restriction is brought? You either give, I, okay, I, I maybe I've been you. told. Can you come down some more? This is where you are taking me. <laughs> Oh, check my crap. Well, it's, difficult, it's difficult to come on, down on some of these taking cash. But basically, one of the recommendations uh, was to separate, you know, in the analog domain. When you do analog, you, you have to have a spectrum. You have to have a channel, necessarily. So, so, so what, what do you want to say? 
What I want to say is that, one, uh, GIBA and all the stakeholders must insist on the strict implementation of the recommendations of the committee. And now, even some of the provisions on uh, the, 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 the policy. Because the, the original uh, policy. 775. So, so hold on. They must insist on the strict implementation yes, of the and then original policy. Yes. That's. Yeah, I want, I want us to leave it yeah. here. That is, okay. That's enough for me. Yeah. And then say that no, will it's, involve. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. I believe you. Thank you. I've understood you. Just for the sake of time, I appreciate it. And since you have so much information on this, if we are having other engagements on other TV stations, we'll invite you. So thank you very much. We'll take a couple more comments. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, am I on? Yes, you're on. Good. Um, I'm 14 years old on retirement. I don't have a job. But I'm a consultant. I offer free services in media, communications, and events. This sort of advertisement is free service. I have several questions, but I'll ask only three. When we say public broadcasting, what do we mean? Elsewhere in the world, whether you are private sector or public sector, you render some public service broadcasting. Are GIBA members engaged in public service broadcasting? The next issue is this. We're talking about cost, levy, tax to raise revenue, to fund public service broadcasting. There is a current TV license uh, operation going on. It is raising revenue. Has anybody given us the cost of public service broadcasting in this country? What is the cost, what's the value? What is the shortfall between the agreed figure and the current TV license that we want to fill with this new system? There's an if, and I want to follow the example of the senior legal practitioner. The if is this. If this system comes into operation, what is the platform for the fixing of the, these new decoders in the rural communities? In my village, for example, how will it be fixed on the new TV set? I think that people must explain that. Accra will be easy, Kumasi will be easy. Regional centers will be very easy, but what about the rural communities? Because currently you buy a TV, take it to the village, there's an internal antenna you plug in and it starts working. I'll remain there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. Very much. That's a three in one. So the, the, the co comments are many. What we're trying to do is to get people to understand that not all the questions should be answered here. So I'm not expecting you to address every question. If you just hear something that you feel you want to touch on. So let me just summarize. So far, we've heard a question about independent content producers. Somebody's talking about the economics of the industry, which this panel hasn't really been asked to address. Then the issue of what interventions the CTO or ITU or other bodies can make. Then there's the issue of going back to recommendations of the original policy. And then God, Big Godi has three uh, points, who's public broadcasting, the current um, TV license regime, and then access to rural people. So there's a lot of things going on here. We'll take how many more? Uh, one, two. We have two more. And then we'll wrap up. We want to close at one. And the time is 12.52. So that we'll go off nicely and do our adverts. So we'll take two more quick points. You and you and then Chief Crystal. Then that's the end of the comments. You have a minute. Uh, yes. Go um, ahead. My, I think my question. Speak up, please. Pa I think part of my question has already been answered. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, it's no, it's just a part of it. So there's little part left. Is what I'm just going to. And I think the, what I'm just trying to say is that uh, we are happy. We've already heard from Mr. Apintin that it was uh, originated during uh, 2011. Uh, I think that one has already been pointed out. But another significant factor I, I have observed, I don't know whether uh, many other people are also observing it. Uh, this is free for all. Uh, initially, I was having a problem uh, with it because even uh, as at this material moment, uh, every form of uh, this thing you are going to, service you are going to get, you pay for it. Even the one we call free for all. Free to air. Uh, free to air. Free to air. Uh, okay. Because I think consumers still bear some cost 
Because even if you want to watch ordinary TV, without uh, even not multi-TV or DSTV, or, you have to buy a pool. <laughs> yes, that is a cost. We shouldn't laugh at that cost. That is a cost. It's an original cost. Uh, even multi-TV, too, you need to buy the decoder. That is also a cost to a consumer. I'm talking about consumer. And uh, not even talking about, I'm coming not to even talk about DSTV. So, and even if you watch, already we are paying, we are paying for all services. So there's no even free to consume or free to air, even right. after this month. Uh, so the, 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 my main point is that, uh, to me, government charging TV license attached to the, D, uh, the DTT, I mean, I think to me it's, it's not a cause for alarm. It's just a form of motivation. Because already the TV license is legal. It's something that we're supposed to be paying. It's bound by every citizen who owns TV to pay. So if now government is just attaching it to a, what do you call it, is it DTT? DTT. It, it's just a form of motivation. Okay. So that is not so a cause for see. alarm. Thank you very much. Final comment, final comment, sir. Please go ahead quickly. Good afternoon. Now, my question is, I'm still struggling to understand the reason why um, the TV license was set up and why it, it continues. Why I'm saying that is, in the past, we had, we had a system. We were operating analog. And it was meant for GBC because they were giving us lots of national items free of charge. I don't know what the law says about that. But now we are moving into a new space, digital space, and the government is still going to make more money from the extra, uh, the spectrum. I mean, once we get to the digital, there's a whole lot of space which they could sell to the telcos. That's what is making the telcos expand. And there are some who still want that space. As of now, those of us who are in business, we don't even know how much we are going to pay for the setup. I mean. Uh, uh, for, for their transmissions because it's not free. Apart from that, we have whoever is going to, how you're going to relay your transmissions to the head end, you're going to pay for that. Apart from that, you're going to pay regulatory license fees to NCA every year. So if there's a condition for TV license, I really, I, I'm struggling to understand what's the purpose and why do we need it? If it's just revenue, then I think now with a new system, the government has huge opportunities of making money. Hence, the re reason Berifi Apentine says we should do the economics so we can argue over numbers, then we'll be clear and all not just be asking questions. So I think it's a very important point. And probably in by way of going forward, there needs to be a conversation on various scenarios, revenue and all of that. So thank you for that intervention. You have the last word and you have a minute, even though you are the chief, you have a minute. We have to go off at one. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take it from what Honorable, of course, as Bill Gabra said. This whole idea of uh, DTT, digital migration, and the problems in between pay TV and free to air certainly should be a matter of discussions, leading, pas these passionate discussions leading to how to solve financial problems. It shouldn't be a case where we think that there are no alternatives. There are tested alternatives where government will even make more money than even the TV license that is this Ghana series. And then every individual would love to pay it because in that scenario, we'll be paying even maybe eight or 10 cities instead of 36. So you don't feel it. It will also allow for the broadcasters to have their freedom and the rights guaranteed to them to be able to offer their broadcast services. The thinking is, should be that we should have the understanding that we are having two types of broadcasting. One is a service trying to render uh, uh, a service as media, and one is for pay. And so the thinking that free, free, literally meaning of free to air is not meaning that um, it is free as you hear it. What we are saying here as free to air is only to compare to what is pay TV, which is encrypted for someone, and its content type is different. 
But free to air is for the broadcasters who go for such classification to offer media services. And so these two differences should be clear in our minds. But right. let us work together. There Good. are solutions. And we should not take a position because we have power mm. and say, let us do it. This is what we will do. This is all Giba is saying. Thank you, Chief Krista. Uh, I don't know if it's within my right to invite the president of the GGA to give closing remarks. Because if we want to attempt to address this point, uh, we will not be able to. And I feel the, the questions more point as to what else is needed to be done. So we've taken note of the questions. Gloria is here. She's facilitating. So I'm sure we have a lot of what you said by way of going forward. So I'm not overruling you, but I feel we should. We have to launch the video. Okay. So Ishira, let, let, let's I call on yeah. uh, Gloria. Uh, here is the executive, executive secretary. secretary of Giba. Um, so there's a campaign. Yes. And we're just going to share some yes. information on that. So please put your hands for my panel whilst we move back. Yes. And then Ishira takes over. So, uh, Gloria will give us um, a background to these videos and then we'll play a couple of them. Over to you. I think she deserves a round of applause for walking down here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, with all the concerns that have been raised by stakeholders, by the broadcasters, Geba, together with all the concerned free-to-air TV broadcasters came together to put together some material in a video, a document. It, it's not a documentary, it's a short video, sort of, to um, enable the public get a good understanding of what the issues are. So basically, that is the video, and I hereby declare the video duly launched. <laughs> Gola joins hundreds of countries around the world in moving from analog TV broadcasting to digital TV. You are probably wondering, what has this got to do with me? Everyone currently watching all free-to-air channels on their analog TV set is encouraged to get a certified decoder from an authorized dealer to enable them continue watching sharper, better, and more TV channels in digital quality or to simply get a digital TV set with no decoder required. National Communications Authority, National Digital Broadcasting Migration Committee, and the Ghana Standards Authority came together to develop a standard for free-to-air digital TV decoders with minimum specifications which will make the decoders, amongst other things, very affordable to you. You all remember this announcement by the NCA. We are in the process of buying a new TV set. Buy a digital ready set. Just look out for the digital Ghana conformity logo. Ghana is ready for digital. With my friend Cool Diggy. Are you ready? To enjoy a world-class viewing experience, get a set-top box for your analog TV or buy a digital ready set. Look out for the digital Ghana conformance logo. It's Digitime in Ghana. Are you ready? This advert is brought to you by the Ministry of Communications. But the Ministry of Communications is making a U-turn to introduce a technology, the type used in pay TV broadcasting into every free-to-air decoder, which will block you from watching your favorite TV programs unless you pay a digital access fee. And Giba is asking why. This technology is sometimes called access control or conditional access. The conditional access is a control mechanism which will scramble your favorite TV programs on your TV set, leaving you the signal with a blank screen. Insisting on this technology for free-to-air broadcasting will have an adverse effect on your fundamental right to freely access information through public service broadcasting. The millions of digital TV sets already certified by the NCA, which have been purchased and installed at individual homes, offices, shops, stores, warehouses, and public places across the country, which are currently receiving digital TV programming, will abruptly stop receiving free-to-air digital TV unless access is enabled by the Ministry of Communications chosen controller or operator through the opening of a conditional access 
encryption key. Even so, can't receive free to air programs unless you acquire the ministry's prescribed CA control decoder in addition. In all the countries of the world that have successfully migrated to digital TV, well, they managed to do so without requiring this conditional access technology. Why should you care? The truth is that a decoder with this technology prescribed by the Ministry of Communications will deny you your right to continue watching digital terrestrial television or will decide for you if you should receive even your free-to-air channels or not. It is your right, our right, to choose what programs to watch. Free-to-air TV should remain free as authorized by the regulator without access control. Free-to-air broadcasting through an intermediary content blocking mechanism such as the CA will make mass media communication vulnerable. Reject conditional access for free-to-air TV now. Digital technology is the future of the world. The evil of its application is the doing of men. We are all excited for TV to go digital. Let's make sure we get it right. Giba is calling on all Ghanaians to wake up and embrace only what is good for us as a people and in accord with the law for the good and growth of our motherland Ghana. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association. Giba. So um, at, at this point, um, I'm going to uh, use my license as MC to change a couple of things. Uh, we would have had um, a closing remark from our chairman, but, and then followed by uh, a vote of thanks. So I'm moving the vote of thanks forward. So we'll thank the chairman in advance. Uh, Gloria, over to you to deliver the vote of thanks, and then we'll take the closing as the closing. Another round of applause. That was the live broadcast of the Broadcasting Media Forum in Accra on the digital migration platform where members of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association did discuss the policy to block free-to-air television content in the country with the onset of the digital migration platform. Thanks so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of our programs. For more news updates, log on to our website at 3news.com.